Okay, good morning. Welcome to the October 6, 2020 public hearing, public meeting of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. I will call the roll. Chair Carroll? Here. Commissioner Bland? Commissioner Shamir Barron? Here. Commissioner Chapin? Here. Commissioner Chen? Yeah. Commissioner Devonshire? Here. Commissioner Goldblum? Commissioner Goldblum? Here. Commissioner Gustafson? Here. Commissioner Jefferson? Here. Commissioner Lutfi? Commissioner Lutfi? You're on mute? Yep, sorry, here. Okay. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Here. Okay, all set. Thank you, Rich. Good morning and welcome to the Landmarks Preservation Commission's public hearing and public meeting day of October 6th. Uh, today, we will be reviewing applications for work on designated properties. And we have one public meeting item, which is the first item of the day. Um, this is an, uh, an application to amend a previous approval. And as a public meeting item, there is no public testimony, although we always post our presentations and welcome written comments on public meeting items. After that, we will begin the public hearing and we have a number of items that will take us through the afternoon. And this meeting is being um, held via Zoom. And if you're interested in just watching the hearing and meeting, you can do so on our YouTube channel. And if you're interested in participating in and testifying in the public hearing items, you can join the meeting and at the, at, um, for each application, we will have the um, information for you to log in and, uh, and join that meeting so that you can testify. And with that, I'll turn it over to Caroline Kane Levy to start the agenda. Good morning. The first application is application number one, docket number 20-10551, 1 East 70th Street, the Frick Collection in the Upper East Side Historic District. Borough of Manhattan, Block 1385, Lot 1, a proposal for a, an amendment to uh, a certificate of appropriateness. A French Louis XIV style mansion designed by Carrere and Hastings and built in 1913 to 14 and altered by John Russell Pope in 1931 to 35. An Italian, a, an Italian Renaissance revival style art reference library designed by John Russell Pope and built in 1931 to 35. A Beaux-Arts style reception hall edition designed by Bailey Van Dyke and Polar and built in 1977. And a viewing garden designed by Russell Page and built in 1977. The application is to amend certificate of appropriateness 19-25099, which among other things approved rooftop and rear yard additions. And this is to modify the approved mechanical screen. And the applicants have joined the hearing. Uh, you know how control of the screen. Uh, remember to state your name for the record, unmute yourself, and you may begin. And, and just before they begin, I do need to actually have a motion to open the proceedings as this is a public meeting item. So commissioners, I'm unmuting you all so that we can do that. And commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? Motion to open the proceedings. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the applicants may now begin their presentation. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Lopergolo. I'm a partner at Seldorf Architects. Um, thank you. Um, nice to see everyone, even if it's this way. Um, so uh, we would like to discuss, as mentioned, the mechanical screen above the addition, um, which uh, Paul, my colleague, will point to as we go through. So this is what we uh, what was shown in our approval. Go next. And what we're discussing is a material change. I think there's a little bit of a delay. Maybe. Yeah, I think next. Yeah. So um, in working with the staff at looking at our construction documents, there was a discussion that came up regarding the screen in terms of its materiality. As, as you've seen in the previous slide, we showed it as uh, limestone, limestone colored uh, and, and perhaps ambiguous about the actual material. In this, in working with staff, we started looking closely and felt that um, actually changing the material to a copper standing seam 
um, seems to be more appropriate for the entire building. And I, I'll go through um, wh what the images look like side by side, and then I'll zone in on what the detail is of the mechanical screen. So next. So this uh, on the left-hand side is our previously uh, proposed elevation. Um, and you can see that the limestone color of the addition of above at the mechanical screen and on the right, the proposed change um, to the copper. And going to the next, so this just takes us around the whole building. Um, obviously the mansion has uh, copper roofs, which um, are seen in this flat elevation may not always be necessarily seen from the street, but we felt that the roofscape lent itself to, to the copper screen above this addition. And again, going around, this is at 71st Street. And then just some street views, comparative street views. So on the left, again, what was proposed and on, on the right, the new uh, proposed copper screen. Okay, so just in terms of understanding our detail here, um, I think that what was important, wait for the next slide, um, obviously the screen can be seen from the street, but what was very important to us was to um, set the screen back from the cornice edge to um, really keep the, the volume down and to, to articulate the height of the limestone area. So uh, when, you, um, when you actually uh, go to the next slide, you can see here, um, this is a mechanical uh, rooftop, as you can see. And we have quite a few mechanical pieces of mechanical equipment that require certain clearances. So when we were delving into this detail, it became pretty clear that having this be a limestone clad block wall would uh, cause a lot of uh, impediment on the movement around the mechanical equipment. Um, we also investigated whether there could be limestone on honeycomb here, um, but that actually felt like it was too fragile because the space between the limestone screen, or sorry, the mechanical screen and the edge of the building is a requirement for someone to be able to stand there and to work with uh, the um, cleaning equipment that for the facade. And so there's fall protection there and you can see the silhouette of a person. So we, it's not like we could push the screen further out to the edges because we need the space to be able to work. And so the limestone clad on honeycomb seemed to be also too fragile to do. So, and the red dash line indicates if we were to make this a block wall, how this also kind of impedes on the, um, uh, impedes on our equipment clearances. So in our construction documents, if we go to the next page, uh, we presented um, for review rather than the limestone. Oh, here's just an indication of the copper roofs uh, around the building. Um, and then, so uh, in the middle slide, you see this, lime, uh, this limestone colored aluminum panel that we had proposed at the po point that um, staff uh, was looking at our construction documents. And they call, brought this up as, as concern about the metal panel. And it was actually very, very good for this to be brought up because it really made us look at this differently. And really we felt that the copper was the more appropriate, um, more appropriate um, material here. Um, it also, um, it, it makes the building seem smaller by not having the limestone color go all the way up. Um, so it really stops it and it feels more appropriate to the, the full scape, uh, scape of the view of the, of the entire building. So if we can go to the next slide, I think we finish it here. So yeah, by picking up that cornice line of the limestone and stopping the limestone there, and then really everything above that would be is the, is the copper around the screen. So that's our, that is what we're here to discuss and hopefully you'll agree with our approach. Okay, commissioners, do we have any questions? All right. All right, well, thank you, Sarah, for a thorough presentation. I think that's 
before. We probably don't have many questions. Um, Rich, I believe we do not have any written comments on this amend proposed amendment. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All right, great. So I think we maybe then can just move right into our discussion. Um, so commissioners, I'm going to start unmuting all of you so that we can do that. And this is, um, yep, this is a proposal. This is an, uh, an amendment as was described to this one discrete element. Um, and when we look at proposed amendments, we um, evaluate whether or not the proposed change is in keeping with the intent of the original approval. And to the extent that it isn't, is, are, is it still appropriate? And um, so this is you know, ch changing the material, but changing it to a material that's found in the roofscape um, within the rest of the complex <clears throat> and on the museum building. So um, any thoughts on this? Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start? Uh, I think it's appropriate. Okay, all right, thanks. And Commissioner Chen? I totally agree, this is much better. Okay, Commissioner Lutfig? I totally agree. And Commissioner Jefferson? Appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson? Well, oh, I, I, I think that uh, the fact that there is no written submission on this tells you that um, uh, the public kind of agrees with us that it actually is appropriate. Okay, great. And Commissioner Shamir Barron? Yes, I think it's appropriate as well. Okay, Commissioner Holford Smith? I think it's appropriate. I think it's an improvement, actually. Great. And uh, Commissioner Chapin? Yes, I agree. It's appropriate. Okay. And Commissioner Goldblum? Agreed. Great. I think, yeah, and I, I agree as well. I think that it does relate to the roofscape. Um, I think it, as was presented, it does actually help to kind of reduce the apparent height of that portion of the new addition and um, is in keeping with the quality of the materials in this complex. So Commissioner Devonshire, would you go ahead and read the motion? Sure. In the matter of 170th Street, the Frick Collection in the Upper East Side Historic District, an application to amend Certificate of Appropriateness 1925099, which among other things approved rooftop and rear yard additions to modify the approved mechanical screen. I recommend approval finding that the mechanical enclosure of the roof of the conservation studio addition featuring an unpatinated copper screen will be in keeping with the palette of historic materials and finishes at the building roofs. And the thinner screen material will maximize rooftop space for mechanical equipment and access, thereby keeping the height and mass of the enclosure proportional to the addition and retaining the depth of typical setbacks of the building complex. Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second it. Okay. Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor, none opposed, the motion carries. And just to note for the record, Commissioner Bland recused on that item and was not present this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Caroline, we'll move to the public hearing portion of the agenda now. Okay, uh, the first item on the public hearing agenda is uh, docket number 21 00282. 405 Vanderbilt Avenue in the Clinton Hill Historic District, Brooklyn, Block 1960, Lot 32. This is an application for a certificate of appropriateness. The Romanesque Revival style carriage house built in 1890, and the application is to construct a rooftop addition. Commissioners, the applicants have joined the hearing. Please state your name for the record, uh, and you may begin. <laughs> and you just need to click the screen to activate control of the presentation. And you can use arrow keys or the mouse to advance. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, so Mr. Dalweg, Von Dalweg, do you have control of the screen? If you can just unmute yourself to confirm. So you, you do have control of the screen, you can start the presentation. Um, I would not know. Hmm. Can you say something? Rick is can you hear me? on the line as well. If you want to, yes, we can. You can proceed. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. You have control of the oh, screen sorry. as well. So, we can, so, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, please, Do I please. have control? Because I don't see my screen currently. Um, is it the is. YouTube always on or? I see. So you have the presentation up, but I can control the presentation. Is that correct? Right? Yes, yes. You can click on it and right. you believe uh, you have done that. And you can use your arrow keys or the mouse to advance through the slides. Yeah, that. Um, okay. All right. Rick, are you there? Hmm. I think we lost Rick as well. Um, I'm so sorry. Seems like more difficult than usual to work. Hello. Ah, here you are, Rick. Hey, Rick. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's go to page two, Philip. Madam Chair, Commissioners, good morning. Rick Azar from 405 Vanderbilt Avenue, a two-story Romanesque revival brick carriage house located within the boundaries of the Clinton Hill Historic District. Proposed at 405 Vanderbilt is a one-story rooftop addition. With us today are architects Philip and Kit von Dahlwig, and they will present their design for the rooftop edition in a moment. But first, some brief remarks on the building history. Page three, please. This image is the 1980 New York City tax photo for 405 Vanderbilt Avenue and shows the building very much as it appears today. There are no 1940 tax photos for the carriage house as it was considered an out, uh, outbuilding serving the mansion at 404 Clinton Avenue. And the practice at the time was to photograph only the main residence. Page four, please. This photograph taken in 1941 shows us the east side of Vanderbilt Avenue between Green Avenue at the far left and further behind this view on the right, Gates Avenue. The second peak at the left is 94 Green Avenue, also known as 401 Vanderbilt Avenue, an Italian revival building completed in 1862 and altered in 1928 to accommodate commercial use at the sidewalk level. To its right is 405 Vanderbilt Avenue, the subject of our larger discussion today, and immediately to its right, 407 Vanderbilt Avenue, an empty lot until the year 2002. Continuing to the right is 409 Vanderbilt Avenue, the carriage house for the mansion at 410 Clinton Avenue, designed by the celebrated Parfit Brothers. This Queen Anne style carriage house with eclectic roof lines was completed in 1882. Further to the right, the final carriage house on this block was in fact built as a car garage, completed in 1919. This colonial revival building with gambrel roof serviced the mansion at 416 Clinton Avenue. Page five, please. Here we have a contemporary partial view of the east side of Vanderbilt Avenue, 401 Vanderbilt at the left, 405 Vanderbilt behind a tree, but clearly identifiable by its distinctive, uh, distinctive parapet. You'll recall the empty lot at 407 Vanderbilt. Now it is a new building completed in 2002. Page six, please. And while the exact date of construction is unknown, we do know that 405 Vanderbilt was in place by 1890. By 1898, the mansion this carriage house served at 404 Clinton Avenue was demolished, replaced by a two family Beaux Arts building completed in 1901 that survives to this day. By 1925, a separate certificate of occupancy had been issued specifically for 405 Vanderbilt Avenue, identifying it as a garage for four cars. 
and in the early 60s, the carriage house is shown as a multiple dwelling. Throughout all that time, the carriage house has remained largely untouched. The 1981 Landmarks Designation Report notes the original central double doors hung on original ornate iron hinges and Romanesque revival details such as the flat and segmented masonry vossoir arches with limestone keystones at the windows and center doors. Also noted is the corbelled cornice below a distinctive parapet pierced by ziggurat openings. In closing, I'd like to share some contemporary street photos. Page eight, please. Both of these contemporary photographs were taken along Vanderbilt Avenue at the left from the corner of Green Avenue and Vanderbilt, and on the right, a view of 405 Vanderbilt Avenue from farther down the block. Page nine, please. The contemporary photograph on the left is taken at the southeast corner of Vanderbilt and Green Avenues, the building at the left, uh, page nine, we need to go back one. The building on the left in this photograph is 94 Green, also known as 401 Vanderbilt Avenue. And at the sidewalk grade, you can see the commercial openings done in the 1928 alteration. The photo on the right, of course, is 405 Vanderbilt Avenue. Page 10, please. On the left, we have another photograph of 405 Vanderbilt Avenue taken from across the street. And at the right, we have a credible recreation of the 1941 archive photo presented earlier. At the end of the block, 401 Vanderbilt Avenue, then to the right, 405 Vanderbilt Avenue, the new building at 407 Vanderbilt Avenue, then 409 Vanderbilt Avenue, and at the right, 413 Vanderbilt Avenue. And at this time, I'd like to thank you and turn things over to Philip. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Rick. So we are proposing a addition on the um, existing on to the existing carriage house at four five Vanderbilt. The building is currently used as a residential building for a family with two um, teenagers, um, a single mom, and a move-in grandma. They um, basically asking for us to allow for more space and therefore um, growing the um, building in um, vertical direction. Um, therefore, we are proposing this um, addition with a, here's the floor plan of um, the third floor. It's a single addition of a bedroom, bathroom, um, reading area and the staircase, which will guide um, up from the second floor. You will see here a front and rear terrace. Um, and let me know when I'm breaking up or anything is not clear, please um, feel free to interrupt. Um, the um, extension itself is 31 by 27 and a half feet. We are stepping back by four feet towards the street side and four foot six um, at the rear. The rear um, is, and here's the roof plan, um, is based upon the 30 feet setback from the rear fence line or property line. The front is a voluntary setback um, from the street um, wall, um, from the ornamental existing wall. The roof itself, um, sorry. the roof itself um, has um, proposed solar panels um, and um, a certain degree on at um, a certain degree of a pitched roof, which will explain which will I explain in a second. That's the front elevation. So we are proposing a um, height in the front, additional height of six foot one from the parapet wall. Um, and then we are sloping back to a um, total of 38 and one eighth roof peak height. That's the um, side elevation seen from the drugstore corner. Um, that's the rear elevation um, with two openings section 
existing. Um, what's here to note, and I think it um, has a lot to do with the development of the scheme, is the electric roof lines of the neighboring um, buildings um, where none is like the other. Um, as we discussed, 47 to the right is a new building which tries to mimic something historical. Um, we are not trying to go that path of reinstating something which was never part of um, the original carriage house. Um, we are proposing a extension which has his own language, um, but um, leaves the existing building and especially the front facade with its ornaments as, as Rick described, um, untouched, which doesn't try to be in competition with it or adding something or at best mimicking some um, carriage house, penthouse, which we never had in the past. Um, here we see um, existing to the left, new to the right. Um, we are staying just shy of the neighboring um, roof line. Um, from there, we are sloping um, back. Um, here are the axonometric drawings, um, existing the operable chimneys, um, flat roof, and that's our um, extension. Now you might notice, um, and I'm not sure if you can see my curther, that um, the existing building, I will go a couple of images back here, um, best seen here. Um, we are proposing to um, add brickwork to meet the height of the um, front parapet wall. Um, and then carry the, um, the cornerstone along that um, brick wall. Sorry about that. So here you see the, the infill to capture that height um, that has multiple function A to give a visual support to the front wall, B to um, reduce the height of the extension visually and C not creating a gap between new and um, existing parapet wall here at that corner and in the rear. Um, again, we are stepping voluntary four feet back. Um, the zoning, um, by the way, was um, approved by the DOB department. Uh, the front ornamental wall from any um, load, but also visualizing, uh, it's also visually um, create um, that offset between old and new. Um, now towards the shape of the building and the proposed volume, um, we, by, by code, we either have to, um, since it's a new um, roof, um, we have to confirm with, um, conform with um, solar use or green roof. Um, the owner, regardless of the code, um, uh, would like to use um, as, um, solar um, energy. Um, to avoid, and that's quite important, what we see currently in Brooklyn, that um, wherever solar is used, we see um, mounting brackets hovering about, uh, above um, brownstones. We are trying to avoid any of these structures and integrating the solar panels into um, the roof pitch so that we um, can satisfy it, A code, but also um, the client's preference for it. Um, secondly, um, the roof pitch over 20 degree allows us to avoid um, um, parapets of 42 inches, means any roof pitch over 20 degrees, again, will allow us not to have a parapet. Um, that will lower the building itself, um, the appearance of the building and helps us in our scheme here. 
that is um, again the illustration of existing proposed um, the front elevation um, the window openings are following <clears throat> the existing opening of the ground floor um, so there's a certain proportional um, and location um, relevance here existing again the brick wall gets extended new the material itself what we are proposing um, is a standing seam metal um, where um, and we, we choose that because we think that a material which we can use as wall covering but also as a um, roof material gives us um, a seamless um, volume where we can then have details which we minimize to almost non-existing versus the existing building where details, ornaments and so on in the foreground. So again, here we're trying to step back with the appearance of the building um, by choosing a material which lets us um, um, fabricate materials which um, almost are seamless as seen in these four um, close up of um, the details. Um, this is the current mock-up, which was visible for the community board and the LPC hearing right now. <clears throat> it reflects more or less, or more, yeah, it is exactly what um, we are proposing in terms of height and volume. Um, and then we have a couple of local examples um, of um, additions which went to the certificate of appropriateness um, at the LPC. You will see always in the left hand corner the address and the docket number and when it was issued. Obviously, that is the Pratt Architecture Building from Stephen Hall. Um, interesting is also here, and I think that's what it is all about the combination of these materials between a traditional material like brick and then a modern build, a modern material. Um, the next one is, um, it's actually on Waverly, but the address is 447, 449 Clinton Avenue. So it's, a, um, I believe, a lot through um, address where the entire extension um, on the left side of this image and the um, staircase up to it, which is a similar clad material is um, built in the, um, after um, 2007. Um, and then the third one, 228 Washington Avenue. Um, that is a vertical of an existing garage which was demolished and that extension was built new. Um, and that last not least, that is the one um, 257 Washington Avenue, but here seen from Hall Street. Um, the roof um, um, extension of um, the, the church, um, I believe, um, on that street with actually um, a similar material, um, but in a different fashion, um, different color, but also I believe it's a standing seam metal. Um, I think that it is pretty much from my end. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, and commissioners, do we have any questions? for the applicant at this time. If you have any questions, raise your hand. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead and just accept my request to unmute you. Uh, just two questions. One about the existing fireplaces. With, with, do you know when, one, when they were, in, when they were, were they, how long they've been there and two, do they function on the interior at all? Um, if we can, well, I, I, am I still in control? Oh yeah, I am. Great. Um, the existing fireplaces, so we have, um, and that's, let me see if I can find the axonometric drawing of it. Here we go. Um, I think one is, the right one is serving, sorry, the center one is serving um, the living room the far left one is serving the second floor bedroom. The living room is um, 
converted to gas, the bedroom is could be made operable again. The front one is not existing, or there's no evidence that there's any um, fireplace in the building. Yeah. But thank you. And we are we are trying to keep them intact. That's why what we are doing in the scheme here, we will. We, we, we don't want to have two chimney outlets, so we are rerouting within the wall towards that chimney, the living room and the bedroom. We are combining them and there are two chimney flutes within that one stack. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, not seeing any hands raised at this time. We'll move to public testimony. And this is the time if there are any members of the public who are in the meeting who would like to comment on this application, please raise your hand so that we can identify you and move you to be a panelist so you can speak. We will start with anyone who signed in in advance first. And so I'm going to turn it over to our executive director, Lisa Kersavage, to walk us through the testimony. Lisa. Okay. Um, we had one person sign up to speak, um, Simeon Bankoff. Um, to me, and I don't see your hand up, but I'm going to bring you in as a panelist. And if anybody else wants to speak on this item, there is your hand. Um, please raise your hand. You got Simi it. And I brought you in. I there you go. It. All right. Uh, uh, good morning, Commissioner Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. Uh, historic Districts Council is the advocate for New York City's designated historic districts and neighborhoods meriting preservation. Its public review committee monitors proposed changes within historic districts and changes to individual landmarks and has reviewed the application now before the LPC. There might be a way to add bulk to the top of this building, but this is not it. To be frank, the design to this very visible addition is reminiscent of a Quonset hut, which is definitely not in keeping with the protected character of the Clinton Hill Historic District. In truth, there's not much precedent for an addition this size being placed atop a carriage house, which is a character defining housing type of this particular historic district. This is a wonderful gem of a building whose details are all in the understated brickwork in Corbele. This addition overwhelms the building like an exceptionally graceless hat. That's exceptionally unfortunate given the building's location on a well-traveled wide street at the entrance to the historic district. HDC recommends denial of this application. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. Anybody else that wishes to speak on this item? Okay, I think that's okay. all of the that's testimony. It. Okay, great. Rich, do we have any written testimony? We do have a resolution from Brooklyn Community Board 2 recommending approval. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'd like to turn back to the applicant team to ask if you'd like to respond to the comments. In, in particular, the, um, if you could address the appropriateness of a visible addition of this size and then the sort of design. And I know you spoke about doing something that was not mimicking something historic and that maybe you know the commission does approve uh, contemporary design. Um, but if you are, you know, can speak a little bit to its relationship to the district, I think that would be helpful in the response. The district and the building itself. Sure. Um, um, well, thanks for the response first at all. And I, um, I understand the, I understand the concerns. Um, I think there are a couple of unique um, factors in place. One is it's basically a corner exposure, right? So we are seeing more from that building than if it's your typical raw house or a carriage house, which is built within other buildings, um, since we are seeing it from, from, yeah, from the corner from two sides. Um, so that might give it a little bit more exposure, but that exposure obviously would be the same with any, any proposal there. Um, that's number one. Number two is we are trying to be um, very careful and trying not to be overwhelming. So that statement is for me a little bit foreign. I'm seeing it actually the other way around. 
yes, we are trying to do something which has an architectural language, but no, we are not trying to um, dove the existing building. And I think that would happen if we would choose a material, for example, like brick, um, that would show suddenly a continuation of the existing building. We're trying to avoid that. Um, I think when you walk by in the future, you should still understand that there is a existing historical building and a new addition. We are not trying to merge the two by themselves. And I think that is also typical for the neighborhood. Even when you see a historical um, roof additions, two brownstones, they are clearly set apart between brownstone, the material brownstones, and a shingled um, mason on top of it, masonette on top of it, or penthouse on top of it. So um, you, could it, you could compare it to that, but I don't even want to go to do that. Um, I think we, we, yeah, it's a unique situation here. That's all what I can say. Yeah. Okay. Commissioners, do we have any final questions? All right, not seeing any hands raised. I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, I didn't get to my hand raising. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, absolutely. Sorry, I didn't raise hand. Um, just confirm for me one more time. When I'm looking at the 1941 uh, tax photo, does, did you say that, that the building, that the existing building was, um, some floors were removed? I'm, I'm just trying to, and I'm sorry if I missed that. Because in the, the historic photo, it seems there seems to be a taller building in that spot. No, it's exactly the same building. So this building find... here, that's that's the building. You see the, the parapet as it is today. <clears throat> Why does it appear to be taller? It does, it's not, you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's not. I think there's a second historical photo, one or before, before that one. Can we just switch to page three? I believe it is. Who has control over me? Okay. You still have control. So this one is from 1940, I believe, that photo. 1980. 1980. 1980. Yeah. I, want, I want to ask you about 1940, the 1940 photo. Yeah. Can you use your cursor to show me where that parapet is, please? Sure, but photo. Yeah. so here you see the parapet. Okay, oh, okay, thanks. It looks more <laughs> vertical, it looks, and it may be, a, you know, an optical illusion because of the- Yeah, I think this is all a little bit- the photo, but yeah. it does look a little taller there, but it-, it it still also looks like only two stories. Down here, down here you see down here you see the door arch. Yeah. In the lower okay. level you see the door arch and then you see the upper windows, the cornerstone. So that is the same what we are seeing here, right? Right. And so it's the building adjacent to it, the other carriage house that was new relative to uh, between the 40s and the 80s. The building next to it is basically less than 10 years old. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Other questions before we move to close the hearing? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? I second the motion. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And um, so I think there's sort of two, we, two, two things we need to think about as we think about the addition. The first is um, in you know, looking at the addition and the visibility of it, does, can one um, accept on a, this particular typology a more than minimally visible addition? And then if yes, then, Number two is, does the, is the design, shape, roof line, massing um, materiality appropriate to this building and within this context of carriage houses, which the applicant has presented, do have some eclectic rooftops, roof lines. So um, 
with that, why don't we start? And Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you like to start on this one? Yes, sure. Uh, you know, I was trying to, I, I, I was hoping that, in fact, I did see that the building historically was taller, but um, that was not the case. I have to say that I am convinced by the argument that these rooftops uh, of the building that was constructed just 10 years ago and then- You're broken up, I think. Sorry, can you hear okay. me? Okay, yes. I'm sorry. So I, I just wanna say that I, I think I am convinced by this argument about the eclectic rooftops. And so firstly, to your first point, should it be visible? Can, may it, can it be visible? And I think, yes, it can. So I, I buy into that. And then the, the way that it's visible is not just sort of uh, something rather conventional or a, 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 a little bit kind of showing, sh showing just because it needs to be a certain head height interior. It's actually making a statement of a kind of a little bit of a whimsical or, a, or, or an exaggerated roof profile. And I, I, I think it does not detract from the historic building. It does not sort of offend the district uh, or and these assembled buildings. It, it's still possible to read the, the interesting parapet and to read the others relative to it. So I think I can approve this as presented. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Holford-Smith. Um, well, I agree with um, the Adi about the, the visibility of the addition. I think that given this location um, and, and the general eclectic roof lines of all these buildings in its row, um, something visible I think is appropriate. Um, I do have some issues with the materiality and the, the, the massing of what's being proposed. Um, one thing that I that I am concerned about is the removal of the parapet wall and the chimneys and, and filling it in with new brick. I think I understand that they wanted to minimize the height of the visibility of the addition, but I think the chimneys are a defining character of the building and um, that they should remain even if they're not being used. And the addition as shown is actually sitting on top of the parapet wall and I think it needs to be brought inboard so it, the parapet can remain free, uh, you know, and the visible, uh, sort of legible on its own. Um, I think that potentially you could infill between the chimneys, but I think the, the chimneys should read. Um, I think that this, there is some appropriateness to the shape of the, um, the massing of the addition. But I think that the, the front is too overwhelming. And I think perhaps if the front peak, the whole portion could be brought down a little bit. Um, I understand they, that they need the angle at the back for the solar panels, which I think is fine. But I think maybe if the front was a little bit lower, it would give a little more variety to the, to the shape and more deference to the, to the brick facade. And then I think that the material is very dark and heavy on top of this building. And I think that that should be looked at, potentially a, a more, a lighter color, perhaps a different material. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I agree with uh, some of the previous comments. Uh, first, I, I also think that the uh, chimney line on the side is, is rather a nice distinctive feature and I don't have a I don't feel the need to raise that parapet to obscure the, because you're going to have a considerable presence of any addition here. Uh, I do think that um, an addition is uh, appropriate and possible here. I find that the irregular, the irregular roof line, I think really is combined with the, <laughs> the color and the material. Uh, really make this a little too um, pronounced and uh, calling attention to itself. Um, I was thinking maybe a stucco in a color that was uh, a lighter, you know, more a color more similar to the brick uh, while still remaining distinctive and clearly being a separate, bill, a separate edition, which I appreciate that the architect is seeking to do. Um, I feel that um, 
I, re I really think that the um, irregularity of the roof line, while I support the solar panels, that there should be a way to work out the solar panels without having such an irregular roof line that just is, uh, I think, uh, very, as they said, attention getting. So uh, those are my comments. Commissioner Goldblum. All right. Um, uh, I, this reminds me of a project that I can't find online, but I, I, either it's a figment of my imagination or, or we really did see it a while ago by David Ajaye for an artist in, on a town on a similar uh, project. <clears throat> it was like a wedge. It was like a big black wedge and it was visible from the back to a, to a street. Um, and we approved it, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I can't find record of it online, but it was, maybe I just dreamed it. Um, but anyway, this has a similar, very aggressive uh, uh, approach. Um, and um, I, I don't have a problem with it in concept. I think, as others have said, I think a visible addition can be done here. Um, I think that the um, idea of, of lowering, the, lowering the front is a good idea. I think that um, uh, the my biggest concern is at the back though. If you look at the rear elevation, um, uh, and you think about that in, in, in comparison with other uh, rooftop additions that we've approved from um, townhouses or, or, or carriage houses all over the place, the proportion of that is just not good. Um, I think that I understand why, I understand the gesture and the, the solar angle, so to speak, but that thing is about 15 feet above, above uh, uh, the roof level, I think it, it, it just completely obscures the proportions of the rear facade. And I think that that has to be uh, modified. Um, I also wanna note that, you know, the bulk of this addition is a somewhat self-imposed thing. This thing has a huge interior court, right? A kind of a, a central court that pushes all the space to the perimeter. So, um, you know, the, the, the notion that this can be scaled down and still keep it uh, as a sizable addition, I, I think is very uh, true. Um, but I, I, I think in general, I have no problem with the material. I think it's interesting. And I think that the idea of this aggressive uh, <laughs> profile visible from the side is acceptable if it is modified. Thank you. Commissioner Devon, Devonshire. Um, I, I'm unmuted. I, I mostly agree with uh, Commissioner Goldblum. I, I think it's perfectly acceptable to have a visible addition on this building. There, there is something about the, the massing and the color of the front portion of it that just smacks of Long Island Railroad <laughs> working shed. And I think that could be completely alleviated by a change in the color and a lowering of that of that very aggressive front wall. But uh, other than that, I, I actually don't have as much of a problem with that, with the rear portion of it. Yeah, I, I, I conceptually, I, I have less of a problem. I think that uh, somehow the uh, extending the side parapet wall does not bother me as much, although I do understand some of the point of view that the commission have expressed. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I hate to play designer uh, because uh, uh, at this moment, uh, but I, I, I'm actually um, fine, uh, I agree with Addy. I, I have less of a concern uh, than the rest of the commissioners. Okay, Commissioner Bland. Uh, yes, I joined the, the meeting a bit late, but I think I have seen enough of it and heard uh, comments now enough to decide that I, I can uh, ethically vote on this and uh, therefore will offer some comments. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much in the Addy camp uh, myself as well. Um, and Anne's comments I think were, were interesting. Lowering the front might help. Pushing in and keeping the chimneys uh, as a remnant of the past also helps. 
I have no problem with the material. In fact, I think the material is quite wonderful. Um, uh, if it were slightly lighter, that would be okay too. But I don't think uh, stucco or some other kind of material like that would be appropriate for, for my eyes at least. And I have <clears throat> no problem with the height uh, in, the, in the rear. I think uh, it's, a, it's actually a handsome ensemble, uh, even if it does rise a little bit more than often we, um, we um, allow in, in the back. Otherwise, I think the whole concept of this is, is really uh, philosophically in line with my own thoughts about how one can add and differentiate um, as one does add. Thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Just wanna make sure I'm not muted. Um, I don't have a problem with there being an addition on top of this building either. I mean, there's no way that it can't be visible. It's just not a big building. And um, so I appreciate the thoughtful um, problem solving the architect has done. And I feel like with some, with some changes, it, it would work within the context. So I, I happen to um, agree with my colleagues who feel like there it wasn't necessary to raise the, the parapet wall. And I like the idea of keeping the chimneys um, so that we can retain some of the uh, um, original feel of, on the top of the building. I'm not having a problem with the materiality. I do also feel that it's too dark and that if it were like a lighter gray, um, it would feel a little more recessive. But I, I also think that the shape is a little bit too irregular. And because the footprint is so small here and the visibility is so great, it would be to me better if the shape were modified a little bit. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson. Um, I like the courtyard, but it doesn't have anything to do with the facade. Um, I'm not opposed to the architectural language change. Um, two things that if you go to, if you go to the uh, drawing that shows the corner, uh, existing corner, this one, I think this corner detail is really quite wonderful. I think it really, gives character to this particular corner. And I think getting rid of that is, is not a good idea. And the, when you paint it, uh, when you have a change of language and you paint it black, the silhouette is what governs the edges of it. And uh, although it's okay, it, it's, it doesn't add much as far as I'm concerned. So I think that could, the outline, the silhouette could change a bit and, and it would be fine for me. Okay. Commissioner Gustafson? Um, I, I think I, I, I agree with um, HDC's comments and, and many of the fellow commissioners. And I think we, we so there's so many suggestions that have been made that um, we may have to see this again. Um, it, it certainly um, adding bulk to the top of this building is, is possible. Um, I think, you know, we normally talk about something being minimally visible when we do that. And here, um, you know, you might even allow more than minimal visibility, but this is, um, I think it's, it's just far too close to the front of the building. And uh, um, so when you look at it head on, but both this angle and the head on angle, you get the result is a, um, is a sort of confusing um, roofscape. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it does um, uh, draw uh, an extraordinary amount of attention to itself and away from that, um, uh, the, the cornice as it stands. Um, and I, I'm okay with the materials, uh, but I do think that um, it, it does require some uh, some work. So, uh, so I don't I can't approve it as it is. Okay, that's great. 
Thank you very much, commissioners, for all of your thoughtful comments. And so I think we did have a number of suggestions today. I think the general gist of this is that um, conceptually, there is a consensus that this building could have a visible addition and that that addition could be contemporary in design and um, somewhat unique given the context, the eclectic roof lines within this context, but that I, that there still needs to be some work to make this sit comfortably on this building and in the context and that, um, you know, includes scaling it down and perhaps thinking, rethinking its finish um, and its color and relationship to the building. And so ways that have been mentioned have been to lower the front, think about lowering the back, setting it back from the sides, keeping the chimneys, which would help to give the historic building kind of a primary reading um, and, and thinking about the color as well. So what we will do is we'll take no action today and we'll ask the applicant to work with the staff to um, develop some a revised proposal that responds to the comments today and we'll have them back as soon as they're ready. Okay, so thank you and thank you. continue to work with the staff and we'll move on to the next item. Thank you. Okay, commissioners, uh, the next item is actually uh, two separate docket numbers that I'll be reading into the record at the same time um, because they uh, are with regard to the same building at two different locations on the building. Um, the, fir uh, the first is item number two, docket number 20-09206, 60 Collister Street, also known as 157 Hudson Street, 4 to 8 Hubert Street, and 49 to 55 Late Street in the Tribeca North Historic District. Grove, Manhattan, block 215, lot 7505, an application for a certificate of appropriateness. A Renaissance Revival style stable building designed by Rich and Griffiths and built in 1866 to 67, altered and enlarged in 1898 to 99 by Edward Hale Kendall and in 1902 by Charles W. w. Romain. The application is to replace entrance infill and install a canopy. And the next docket number is 20-09201, 55 Late Street with the similar AKA addresses in the Tribeca North Historic District of Manhattan, Block 215, Lot 7505, um, a Certificate of Appropriateness, and um, a Renaissance Revival style stable building designed by Rich and Griffiths and built in 1866 to 67, altered and enlarged in 1898 to 99 by Edward Hale Kendall and in 1902 by Charles W. Romain. And the application is to replace entrance infill. Um, commissioners, the applicant has joined the hearing. Um, you now have control of the presentation. If you could just click on it to advance slides and please state your name for the record and you may begin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Hi, I'm Catherine Dean from Dean Wolf Architects. In addition to having, a, having an award-winning practice, I'm also an academic with 17 years of experience at Columbia University, followed by 10 years as director of the Graduate School at Washington University in St. Louis. Thus, I go about finding solutions through research, which this presentation will show. The building under consideration is the Old American Express Stable Building on Hubert, Collister, Late, and Hudson. The proposal is for the renovation of two entries. 60 Collister entry is the main entrance for the condo and 55, why has my hand gone away? Oops. There it is, 55 late is an individual owner unit. The building has had multiple changes over time, which I'm trying to elucidate by going through the history of the different facades. These changes through time are also the way that I arrived at a solution that allowed the entrances to work with each other. In 1866, the Amer original American Express building was on the corner of Hubert and Collister. It was a two-story building, very simple. The alignment of the right middle sill and the large 
opening of the door suggests that the original sec second floor openings were single openings as single windows. In 1898, the building was extended to Late Street. A three-story facade was created as a mixture of Romanesque and Rena Renaissance revival styles. The peeling stucco of the second floor windows and the brick detail that's fallen away on the first floor suggests that this decorative brickwork were, was not original, but was added at this time. The 1937 photo of the top right corner and the 1992 photo of the top right corner suggests that this higher massing of the top right was probably done at this time to balance the offset doorway. In 1902, the eastern portion of Late Street was added. This is now known as 55 Late Street and a wing was extended to Hudson Street. The Hudson Street facade at that time was solid wooden doors, similar to the doors that we saw on, Hud on Hubert Street. On Late Street, this is 55 Late Street, there were four single windows which had a transparent opening onto Late Street and gave a liveliness to the street facade. On the interior, you can see, still see the brick arches that were there. In 1946, the building was remodeled for use as a factory. The Hudson Street facade was renovated into a townhouse image to look like the, the townhouses, which were at that time adjacent to it. The Late Street facade had two large garage openings that were, that were inserted into it with large concrete lintels that cut off the decorative brickwork for the, for the four windows that were originally there. Steel truck guards were added at the lower level. At some point, the Collister Street entrance was bricked in with low grade brick. It's not clear when this happened as there are no photos or historical references as to what this entrance looked like. Thus, the two entrances that I'm looking to replace, this entrance at 55 Late and this entrance on Collister Street have no, historic, have no historical references um, in, their, in the current condition that was found when the building was renovated. So the building was renovated in 2005 for uh, use as loft living. The Landmarks Preservation Commission approved a two-story addition atop the building that is not visible from the street. The Hudson Street facade was made completely transparent to match the neighboring buildings and to enliven the pedestrian facade of Hudson Street. The Late Street facade accommodated a garage door opening and two living units. The first living unit was here and the second living unit was here. The Collister Street facade became the main, main entry for the building. There were also multiple non-historical changes that were made to the building. More elaborate windows were added to Collister Street and to Hubert Street, another one on Collister Street here. Multiple decorative structural elements were added that mimicked the original steel structural ties on Hubert Street, Collister Street, and on Late Street. And the volume at the southeast corner on Hubert Street was removed to allow light and view for apartments in the addition. In 2020, Dean Wolf Architects proposes renovations to the ground floor openings of 60 Collister Street and 55 Late Street to bring the building into the contemporary condition of the surrounding buildings and streets. In 2005, Tribeca North was a relatively deserted district. Many ground floors had shuttered windows and doors that reflected the partially renovated condition of the neighborhood. Since that time, Tribeca North has developed into a vibrant community. Most of the buildings have been renovated and most ground floor conditions are transparent, creating a more welcoming atmosphere for the district. In the spirit of the continuous renovations that the building has undergone, reflecting the changed conditions of the neighborhood, the building is brought into a contemporary condition. Two non-historical openings on Collister and on Late Street are replaced with more transparent openings that solve user needs and sensitively fit into their context. The incre increased transparency mirrors the current conditions of Late and Collister Streets. In, some, in the same way that the 2005 renovation of Hudson Street transformed a solid facade into a transparent one to echo its adjacent buildings. On 60 Collister Street, 
the transparent main door solves a safety concern in the neighborhood. With the increased foot traffic in Tribeca North, the solid door, appropriate for 2005, now too often swings open into oncoming pedestrians. Transparency will allow residents to see anyone coming and avoid future collisions with neighbors, strollers, etc. The addition of the canopy, a feature of the Tribeca North District, alerts passersby of the oncoming of the upcoming front door of the building. It pairs with a canopy across the street, which is of similar construction and serves the same pur purpose for that entry. On Late Street, the proposed doors pair with the pair of doors and the pair of windows to create more openness at the street level. The increased transparency echoes the transparency of the pair of windows that were originally at this spot. And they replace the completely closed and uninviting current facade. At the same time, the proposed doors keep the scale and details of the existing doors and maintain the small scale transom overhead to become a hybrid of the doors and windows that fit into the context. These are the conditions of the three front primary streets for the building. As you can see, everything that has been renovated is transparent and urban friendly. The building sits here between this building and this building on Hubert Street. These are all the openings across the street on Collister. And the building sits here between this building and these buildings on Late Street. There's one unrenovated opening on Collister Street. This is the canopy that I was talking about, which is right across the street. You can see it's a small projection um, and again, a very narrow sidewalk. And without that small projection, there would be no way of knowing that there's an entrance coming up for anybody walking down this sidewalk. These are other conditions of canopies in the Tribeca North um, District. The district was renovated after the tri central Tribeca um, neighborhood, which is where my office is, and many more of the canopies were maintained in Tribeca North. These are photos of the earlier condition of the neighborhood with solid storefronts, of which there are very few left. The closed defensive feeling of these storefronts has been removed in this transformation. In the existing condition, the 60 on this front door is the only thing calling out a very small entry. The numbers 55 late call out a sm messy smaller door inside of um, with its own set of hardware set within the larger doors. In the proposed condition, the existing structural ties are used to suspend a canopy with and to enlarge the presence of the entry. And a transparent door creates a more inviting entry. On Late Street, the messy small, small door is removed and a simple pair of doors is inserted. Transparency at the ground floor creates a liveliness that ties the rest of the street frontage on the, on the existing buildings adjacent to it into a contemporary facade that is a lot more lively. The existing door on Collister, in addition, is held by really tiny mullions. It's a heavy wood door, and the tiny mullions that are holding it are way too small. So the door flexes in its frame, and it's rarely closed. The existing security cameras were not LPC approved. In the proposed entry, security cameras are moved up into the canopy. The entry is made much safer and more welcoming for everyone, as owners can now see passer passersby before opening the door. The existing brick details over the top of the steel head show the original, original details of the pair of windows that sat in this entry. Here you can see better all the different existing conditions. The small door, the double hardware, the 55, the doorbell, the garage door, and the transparency of the adjacent storefronts. The proposed pair of doors clean up all the messy details. The doors use the transparency of the adjacent storefronts to mimic the original windows that sat in this place and to contribute to the transformed condition of the neighborhood. The transom and trim details of the existing doors are maintained to keep the scale and character of the building. The existing door location on Collister 
is pushed back in the proposed in the proposed uh, storefront to keep the door as far as possible out of the passersby's way. The depth of the frame is increased to accommodate a concealed steel frame here and here and here. This will give the door stability. The envir environmental performance of the entry is increased by the solid wood construction and by the better insulation of the glass, as well as the simple fact that the door will stay closed. The existing doors on late have even less environmental control with a, a, with a leak here and a leak here with almost no closure. The proposed doors have the same construction as the Collister door, so the performance will increase here as well. The trim details match the existing details in both section and in plan, and the glazing details of the door match the transom details of the window. The canopy is a simple industrial construction similar to the historic Tribeca canopies found throughout Northern Tribeca. The lighting and the security cameras are concealed within it. Everything is painted to match the existing dark green color of the building. In closing, I return to both entries with the exist, existing and the proposed conditions side by side. The entrance of the existing building is a stark brick wall with a dark entry beneath it in a narrow alleyway. The new entrance at, at 60 Collister is a canopy that brings scale and announces the entry and a transparent door that brings light into the alleyway. The existing entrance at 55 late is on a sidewalk that is made dark and uncomfortable with so many blank doors on the north facing facade. The new entrance at 55 late proposes a more delicately scaled and brighter pair of doors that recall the lightness of the original windows of the building and enliven the sidewalk and street front of the north facing facade. Both new entrances contributed, contribute to the transformed condition of the Tribeca North neighborhood. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? This is, um, it's two entrances we're talking about. So, and the, it's about uh, changing, replacing previously commission approved doors that were partial wood and partial transparency to do more um, transparent doors and a canopy at one of those entrances. Okay, so not seeing any hands raised uh, for questions, we'll move to public testimony. So if you're here from the public and would like to speak, raise your hand so we can identify you. And I'll turn it over to Lisa Krasavich to walk us through the testimony. Lisa. Okay, we had one person um, sign up to speak. Um, Simeon Banko has brought you in as a panelist. Good morning, commissioners. Simeon Bankoff, Historic Districts Council. I kind of have to laugh looking at the presentation with all the shadows on those buildings. It's impossible to take good pictures of buildings without uh, heavy shadow lines in Tribeca. I know I've tried several times. Um, well, the proposed awning on the Collister Street is hung from existing tie rods and respects the existing building openings. It still struck us as somewhat visually ungainly for such a strong and handsome facade. Those are our only comments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else wish to speak? Please raise your hand. Okay, I don't see any of those hands raised. Okay, thank you. And Rich, do we have any written testimony? We do have a resolution from Manhattan Community Board One recommending uh, approval with modifications, um, specifically with concern to the proposed awnings. Right, and I think they address the size of the awning as well as uh, did they address material or details or just the size? Uh, they said that they were out of proportion and character. Okay, all right. Um, so Ms. Dean, would you like to respond to the comments? They were really largely about the, can the proposed canopy, um, both in terms of its, you know, the placement in, the, in its first instance and then the design and size. So uh, originally the canopy was higher on the wall than it is now. Um, and when I talked to the community board, 
So originally that canopy was about 18 inches higher on that wall than it is currently. And when I talked to them at the community board, um, I recognized that I had placed it relative to the overall facade, not relative to the entry. And I realized that the bottom line of the double hung window was a better place to place that canopy. And so I revised the proposal and dropped it. And I have a meeting to talk to them on Thursday to see if they will approve this, this location of it instead. All right. So, and when you, so when I dropped it, it felt like it was more a part of the entry and not a part of the wall. And I thought that was, I, I thought that their comment was accurate. Okay, thank you. All right, commissioners, do we have any final questions? And I am going to start unmuting all of you so we can move to closing the hearing. So many of you will have to accept a request to unmute. Whoops, I'm sorry. Michael Goldblum, I just muted you. <laughs> okay. All right, so I think we don't have any other questions. So let's um, make a motion to close the hearing. Commissioner Lotfi, would you make that motion? So moved. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. So, um, you know, this is a proposal, as I said, for to, to replace two previously approved doors at two different entries on opposite sides of the building and to install the canopy above one of them. And um, why don't we, Commissioner Holford Smith, would you like to start on this one? Sure. <clears throat> Well, I think both of these um, changes are improvements to the, to the building. Uh, I think on Late Street, um, creating large glass doors is um, much more welcoming uh, entrance. Um, so I think that's appropriate. Um, on Collister, I understand some concerns about the, maybe the scale of the canopy. Um, and the only thing that I would consider would potentially to be making a little bit narrower, but there's already so much hardware on the facade that I think adding more points, like bracket points, would just be more cluttered. So I think I can accept it as is designed. Okay, great. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I agree with uh, Commissioner Holford Smith. Um, mm -hmm. I everything she said actually, and I can approve it as presented. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum. Um, I'm I'm a little troubled by it. I, I think that. I mean, this is a remarkable building, and I think part of its part of the things that makes it remarkable is its planarity and kind of simplicity. Um, so I can accept the canopy, but I worry that it encroaches too much on the on the brick arch. Uh, I understand why the applicant moved it down, but I just want to ask them to maybe look with staff to make sure that the. the, the Solidity and planarity and simplicity of that of that entry arch is maintained. I think that the door work at that location is fine. I think that on the uh, other on the other street on Late Street where 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 they're changing out the garage door, um, I think that I'm I'm concerned that you know we're losing the um, industrial layer of history by changing it to glass, but we're not putting back the historic glass. We're putting back a kind of a combo of the two. I'm, um, I'm, I'm not so comfortable with that. I, and I, I would say that either, either the door should remain something that has a much more industrial feel that retains pro hopefully some of the original material or that reverts to the original brick windows, maybe one of them can be a door, but that either either restores it or maintains it. Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. I'm, I'm okay with the with the uh, late street entries actually, although I, I would like to see more of that industrial look maintained. Um, 
And I think the applicant could do that working with staff. I'm most troubled by the size of the canopy on Collister Street, which I, I think is far too monumental and, and completely overshadows that, that really nice arched entry. And I think uh, they need to work with staff to, to diminish the size of that thing. Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I, I conceptually have no problem with it, but I do agree with the two Michaels, uh, some of the comments. Commissioner Bland. Um, I, I wanna note that um, the applicant at the outset suggested that she would uh, um, deep, deeply analyze not only the building, but the context of the building. And I appreciated that analysis. And I think uh, it was useful. And I think um, unlike often we, we do, we just focus on the building. And I think she wanted us, and I like this, uh, to, to focus a little bit more on the urban design of the district immediately around the building, particularly, <clears throat> and it's change over time. So that's a little bit of a new dimension. Um, in other words, what's appropriate, not just for the building and its history, but for the neighborhood and it's changing. Um, nature. So I appreciated that and just wanted to go on record as saying that. Um, given that, uh, however, uh, I find that the, um, the changes that are being proposed here are appropriate, uh, accept them, like many of the other commissioners have already said, uh, and for the reasons that they have said. If anything, maybe the, um, the uh, canopy is just a little bit large. I, I, ho I hope, I presume that trucks occasionally trumble down that street. And I think it might be a little bit vulnerable as well, but that's not for us to say, but for maybe the applicant to think about if indeed a suggestion to reduce its size is uh, brought, brought forth. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi. Hi, um, so I think I'm adding on a little bit to what Fred was saying. So much of North Tribeca has changed. And I think there's been um, many buildings have come be before the commission uh, that have been um, converted into residential use. And I think in many of these instances, uh, the, those buildings re have maintained their integrity. And I think this building overall, you know, coming before us really has maintained its integrity as well. But there is a practicality here that I think we need to consider, which is it's a residential building. Uh, the, the, I, we truly appreciate the two issues that the applicant raised, which were the need to call attention to the entrance at the ground floor. Um, the fact that uh, glass at the, in the doors would be helpful um, from a visibility standpoint, which is important for safety. And it's actually very, um, it, it's something that is not uncommon in all uh, entrances to residential buildings. So I'm not having a problem with the glass. It, it, at the base, I'm also not having a problem with the canopy. Again, it, it signals officially, this is the entrance to the building. I think in terms of the scale of this building, it's not too large. It seems to, um, it doesn't call, when I look at the, you know, the view of the entire building, uh, it doesn't call attention to it on Late Street. I, I think it actually could be raised a little higher to just to make sure that the, the um, original arch can be appreciated. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson? Um, I, I agree with my fellow commissioners, David Michaels. I think um, the entrance on Lye Street, it have a little roughness to it. It's some vestige of the industrial quality, not just pristine. And I think the Collister canopy uh, needs some work. It's too big, it's too heavy. I, I, you know, it, it, 
it doesn't fit with the facade as well. I, I think it should be rethought or rethought in detail. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Gustafson. Uh, actually, I think all of the the uh, the proposed conditions are an improvement. I think the uh, the doorway design is compatible with the facade details. Uh, you know, the canopy I think is simple and it fits the district. I think this angle, the picture they're showing here, um, is uh, does itself does the canopy a disservice because if you move further away from it, I think you'll, the proportionality uh, changes. So in size, location, and design. Um, I, I think the canopy actually looks like it's always been there. So I, I could find it appropriate as is. Okay, and Commissioner Shamir Barron. Thanks. Uh, well, I think I can approve glass glazing the doors, both on Late and Collister. I think that the defining feature of this spectacular building that I've loved for so long is this grand a blank space above the main arch doorway, which if there was ever a doorway that already called, uh, identified itself as the way in, there it is. Uh, it absolutely does not need a canopy. I think that the canopy detracts, um, uh, defiles the facade of this building and I'm absolutely opposed to any canopy smaller or bigger in this location between that incredible entry arch and that beautiful portal set deliberately well above it. Um, so uh, that's my position about that canopy. All right, so I think um, looking at this, and we have two applications before us. So one is for 55 Late Street, <clears throat> excuse me, which is for the door. And I think um, we have enough votes to approve that as is. And um, for 60 Collister, which is the door and the canopy, um, we actually have one, two, three, four. Uh, we, we um, I think, have had some comments about, obviously, there's Commissioner Shamir Barron. I know you wouldn't approve a canopy here at all because of the planarity of the facade. And I think, Commissioner Goldblum, you were talking about a canopy might be OK, but I think you had similar concerns. Um, but others, I think, might have been okay with a canopy if it were smaller, narrower, and its placement is restudied relative to the arch. So um, we could try to make that motion and see where we get. So Commissioner Holford Smith, could you do these motions? So 55 Late Street would be for <coughs> approval, and uh, 60 Collister would be approval with modifications to re to reduce this the projection and size of the canopy and to restudy its placement relative to the blank uh, wall, the solidity of the wall and the arch of the entry. Sure. Uh, in the matter of LPC 20-09206, 60 Collister Street, AKA 157 Hudson Street, 4-8 Hubert Street and 49-55 Late Street in the Tribeca North Historic District. The application is to replace entrance infill and install a canopy. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Tribeca North Historic District. Uh, I recommend approval. Are there are actually two. Okay, there are two. There are two. <laughs> Sorry. I recommend approval finding that the replacement of the existing modern entrance infill. Sorry, this is um, approval with modifications. That the replacement of the existing modern entrance infill will not result in the loss of any historic fabric. That the proposed clear glazing at the door will address safety concerns related to limited visibility from the interior when opening the existing outswing door onto the narrow exterior sidewalk. That the design of the proposed entrance infill will be well related to the arched opening and fenestration of the building that the infill will be small in size and recessed in placement in relation to the masonry facade, helping it to remain a subordinate presence. That the canopy will distinguish the opening as a primary entrance to the building and be anchored at existing anchor plates. That the canopy will be simply designed, compatibly scaled to the entrance and typical in terms of material and finishes. 
and that the proposed canopy lighting and replacement security cameras will be small in size, simply designed and discrete in placement. And that although no evidence has been found that canopies historically existed at this building, the presence of this element will be in keeping with the industrial character of this building in the Tribeca North Historic District, which historically featured these elements. However, I find that the size and scale of the canopy and the relationship of it to the uh, arched brick opening um, should be further studied to uh, reduce the size of the canopy and improve its relationship to the, to the existing masonry opening. Okay, and Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Nay. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Okay. Turn in favor and oppose. The motion carries. And the matter of LPC 20 092015 55 Late Street, AKA 157 Hudson Street, 48 4 8 Hubert Street, and 60 Collister Street in the, in the Tribeca North Historic District. The application is to replace in, uh, entrance infill. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Tribeca North Histo Historic District. I recommend approval, finding that the replacement of the existing modern doors will not result in the loss of any historic fabric. That the existing ground floor infill at this facade is not currently uniform, and the presence of variations of infill within the deeply recessed phase at the base of this substantial masonry facade will be compatible with the building design that the proposed doors will be simply designed and in, and in keeping with doors found at buildings of this age in terms of materials, operation, configuration, and finish, that the limited amount of proposed translucent glazing within this context will remain a subordinate president, presence, which will not detract from the sense of solidity at the building base, and that the work will not diminish the special architectural or historic character of the building or the historic district. Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Commissioner Goldblum? Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutby. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. And Commissioner Goldblum, if you are there. Looks like he. he okay, does. with 10 in favor, none of them, one not present, motion carries. Right, so those are both approved one with applications and Steen, please continue to work with the staff on addressing those recommendations, those uh, conditions of the approval. All right, and Caroline, we'll move to the next item. Okay, uh, the next item is item number four, docket number 21-01484, 287 Broadway at the 287 Broadway building and individual landmark. Borough of Manhattan, Block 149, Block 29. This is an application for a certificate of appropriateness. An Italianate and French Second Empire style store and loft building designed by John B. Snook and built in 1871 to 72. And the application is to install signage. Um, commissioners, the applicants have joined the hearing. Um, please note that staff will be presenting with the applicants available for questions. Good morning, commissioners. Dina Taswinter, preservation staff. 
The item before you is 287 Broadway, an individual landmark located at the corner of Broadway and Reed Streets. The application is to install signage at both facades. Uh, commissioners will note that a certificate of appropriateness was issued in October 2015 for full ground floor storefront replacement and that a staff level permit was concurrently issued for interior demolition and construction work. The project is currently underway. Um, and as part of that approval, the southernmost bay along the Broadway facade, which was historically a stoop, as you can see here, is being constructed to match the other bays along the storefront, including the installation of cast iron piers here and here. The aspects of the proposed work before you now, which require commission review, include the following. Firstly, the installation of two bracket signs into cast iron, one at the new non-historic pier at the southernmost bay on Broadway, and one located here at the Reed Street facade into a historic cast iron pier. Per code, the bracket signs cannot be installed into the storefront infill as they would not achieve the necessary 10 foot clearance from the sidewalk. And this is why applicants are proposing to install them into the cast iron. Secondly, the installation of three metal plaques, two at the corner pier, uh, one here, one here, and then a third one above the pier, uh, this pier on Reed. Um, and then finally, the installation of translucent privacy film at two adjacent bays along the Reed Street facade. The applicant is proposing privacy film at these locations due to the sensitive nature of the banking work that will be conducted at the interior of this portion of the storefront. Commissioners will note that all of the interior signage, vinyl, door poles, et cetera, um, shown here are not part of what you are currently reviewing as they meet staff level rules. Here's the proposed installation method for the bracket sign armature into the cast iron. The size and projection of the signs conform to LPC rules. And this shows the dimensions for the proposed metal plaque signs at the three uh, aforementioned locations. This rendering shows the full scope of work in its entirety. Note again that the signage of the transoms and any interior illumination shown here are not under your review as they meet staff level rules. Here are the two bracket signs. So you can see them in context, the three metal plaques, and then the uh, privacy film is out of view at the two bays here. This detail shows that film. Um, that's the full scope of work and the applicants are here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Do we have any questions, commissioners? I just had one question. The, the little square signs at the top of the columns, are those, how are those attached to the cast iron? Are they? Um, I believe they're just going to be affixed to the cast iron with some sort of glue or adhesive, but if the applicants have any further comments, they can add that. Would the applicant like to address that or say anything else at this time? Hi, good morning. This is uh, Brian Giroux with Core States Group, the architect for TD Bank. Um, I just wanted to confirm, you know, what Dina had mentioned about the sign. They would just be siliconed non-destructively to the cast iron so that they could be removed in the future and not damage the, uh, the facade. So they're not being mounted or drilled into the cast iron. Okay. And the the column, the cast iron column um, to the side of the, to the left of the entry is a new column. Is that right? It's not a historic cast iron column? Correct. Okay. All right. And Commissioner Gustafson has a question. So please go ahead. Now, is, is there any precedent for the, uh, the metal plaques that are on the, um, the tops of the piers? Um, not at this, not at these facades. Uh, in, the, in the neighborhood, other buildings? Um, not as far as I'm aware. Thank you. I don't... So I think we will now move to testimony and I see we have one hand raised. So if there's anyone from the public who would like to speak on this application, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And we will, uh, as always, start with people who signed, in, signed up in advance. So I'll turn it over to Lisa to walk us through the testimony. Okay, great. We had one person sign up to speak, um, and that's Simeon Bankoff. Um, Simeon, you should be all set. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Simeon Bankoff, Historic District's Council. 
This is far too much signage for this historic store and loft building, even given its prominent corner location. There are signs on the pilasters, bracket signs, door poles, and enormous lit interior signs behind the glass. To better respect this building, which has had such a remarkable rebirth, the signs on either side of the pilaster should not be allowed. Given the large interior signage, they seem like purposeless overkill. HTC further questions the precedent for bracket signs on, the, on a bank. We could not easily come up with another example of one, although there seems to have been a bracket sign on the building in the past. If a bracket sign is, is allowed, it, um, it should be installed in the infill rather than the prominent cast iron corner as the proposal seems to state. However, it too feels unnecessary given the prominence of the interior sign in this broad, generous windows in this very prominent space. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, don't see any other hands raised for this item. Okay, thank you. And before we move back to the applicant, I just wanna ask Rich if we've received any written testimony. Yes, we did receive a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 1 recommending denial of the application, uh, stating that the lighting and the signage were overwhelming and out of character. Okay, thank you. All right, now um, I would like to turn back to the applicant. You may now respond to any of the comments you heard in the testimony. Thank you very much, Chair Carroll. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Paul Pru, and I'm here on behalf of TD Bank. I'm a, a land use lawyer and an urban planner. Um, I'm joined by Dave Del Rossi from uh, TD Bank, uh, who's here to answer questions, as well as uh, Brian Giroux, the project architect, who you've heard from already. Um, we really like this uh, proposal, uh, in, in part at least, because the building was originally designed as a bank. And so we're going back to the original use from uh, 1871 when the building was built. The construction occurred at an important time in the transition of the city's history from, at least from this, in this part of Manhattan, from a primarily residential district to really the shopping district of the city. And in fact, the findings and designation of the building in the designation report uh, mentioned that the building played an important graphic or represents an important graphical illustration of the transformation of Lower Broadway in the 19th century from a residential boulevard to the city's commercial center. So um, there is a long history of uh, multi-story commerce with in-your-face signage at each level in this building. Uh, as shown in the 1912 photo photography that we've provided. Um, and then, you know, this sort of idea of, uh, you know, really kind of over the top commercial uses, um, you know, was the kind of thing mentioned, in the, as mentioned in the report, was the kind of thing that is uh, further illustrated by uh, the Siegel Cooper department store that was built 25 years later at Flatiron or the Wanamaker store at Astor Place. And um, you know, the, the rest is history as they say. But again, this important reason for designating the building plays into the proposal here where we've again uh, you know, proposed signage consistent with the original use of the building. Uh, in addition to the, uh, the signage, uh, you know, the building also uh, follows along here with tall and wide open show windows at each floor and um, as the, as the building changed tenants over time, those, that signage continued to change. You've seen the historic photos in the presentation from the 1940s as well. Several other bracket signs, uh, the 1980s at the time of designation, uh, you know, an era of excess, uh, you might say. Uh, there was the large uh, sign that kind of covered the whole front on Broadway uh, for an optical center. Um, so the building has always expressed a commercial presence on the ground floor and the current proposal would continue that expression in a contemporary matter, bidding of another bank use for which the building was originally designed. So uh, we recognize that in 2020, a, a bank use does not win awards uh, for favorite neighborhood retail use, particularly at community boards, uh, but we do recognize the community board's concern, particularly regarding lighting uh, and the nighttime illumination. And we will, uh, as always, work to uh, work with the community and the stakeholders uh, to become a, a positive um, presence in the community. And um, we will work with uh, this same community as the intended customer base for the bank. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it only makes sense, uh, you know, in a variety of ways. Uh, 
Um, lastly, I'd just like to mention that um, you may have noted the borough president's recent report identifying the increase in vacancies on Broadway, uh, which in 2017 uh, involved 188 storefronts uh, and now in 2020, 335. So clearly retail and commercial uses on Broadway are changing yet again. And uh, we'd like to you know, point to the consistency of the, uh, you know, the historic changes on the street as uh, you know, uh, uh, an argument for the appropriateness of this proposal. Uh, and we'd like to uh, emerge now into this new uh, phase as a, a, positive, um, you know, a positive presence on the street. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any final questions? For the applicant. Okay, I guess I have one question. I think, um, you know, you did represent in the presentation that that this is a commercial building and that historically, it had signage uh, at all of the sort of spandrels or cornices between the floors. Um, you know, I think the little signs on the top of the. I just wonder if. You, did you, had you considered something on a mesh maybe over the cornice, um, more like some of the historic examples, or what were you thinking about the, with these small little squares at the capitals? I mean, they are sort of smaller in size than some of the, something on a mesh would be, but also sort of unusual in location. And so how does that, I think maybe it's a question of appropriateness, but also how does it help you with your visibility and your your use. Brian, do you want to take that? Sure. Uh, again, this is Brian Giroux. Um, I, I, I don't think we've considered sort of mesh signage, but we were looking at a way to just increase branding and exposure on the street corner for TD. And um, that seemed to be, uh, it, it was, a, you know, with, with the design of the facade being cast iron and the storefront windows, there wasn't a whole lot of placement area for signs that could fit um, coherently with the and appropriately with the, um, the design of the architecture. So we looked at the capitals as sort of a flat facade where we could place a, a sign non-destructively again, but would just fit proportionally with the architecture and not cover it, not um, conceal it, not modify it. Um, you know, we were just looking to just get a little more signage. You can see we're only proposing four square feet per street frontage. So, you know, just trying to eke out as much as we can, but not trying to overwhelm the existing architecture was the intent of, of those uh, one square foot plaque signs. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Commissioner Jefferson, did you want to ask a question? Uh, you're on mute, Commissioner Jefferson. Okay. Um, it seems to me that your visual intent was to define your zone on the pedestrian level or the urban level. And yet it seems, it seems to, when you look at the right-hand side of this image, the end of your domain, there isn't a a sign, and I'm curious why. Why did you not end it with a with a sign at the end? Uh, it's it's because um, you know we the, the the main entrance for the bank is going to be on Broadway. That's customers and employees. The entrance that uses so that's where we had the secure money counting and. Um, privacy concerns with having done the vinyl. So we didn't want to brand that or really bring attention to it as an entrance for customers potentially, as well as the two doors at the very end, that's for the residential spaces above. Um, so we wanted to kind of differentiate and not really bring attention to it, but we do have that projecting metal banner sign um, at that second door just to kind of capture and maybe bookends TD's tenant space as opposed to the rest of the residential portions to the building. Um, so that's why we didn't do those um, placard signs um, at the end, because it's uh, you know, ultimately, I don't think it's even um, 
TD's uh, tenant space, if we put it there, it'd be slightly on the residential portions of the, the ground floor space. It's also a, a long and narrow uh, facade, right? So uh, the idea is to uh, bring a representation uh, further west in order to just, uh, you know, for wayfinding purposes. So you, you're telling me the translucent frosted privacy vinyl, that space is, it is your space too, no correct? Or am I missing? That is your space. Correct. Okay. okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. Other questions, commissioners? Okay, so I think we'll move to close the hearing on this one and I'm starting to unmute all of you. So for those of you that have to accept that request, please do so. Um, Commissioner Bland, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Commissioner Gustafson? Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, Commissioner Jefferson, would you like to start this one? Oh, yes. Um, I, I think this is a fairly simple one for me. I think the, the signs <clears throat> and, the, and the columns should be removed. I think there's enough signage. And I think uh, the argument to define a zone of ownership makes sense. And what the way they did this didn't make any sense to me. So I think removing the signs that uh, on the columns, uh, I, I think I suggest removing the signs on the columns. Okay, both the flat ones and the bracket signs? The, the, the all of them, yes. Okay. All right, Commissioner Gustafson. Um. I actually love the um, the in interior lighting and signage and the kind of glow that it gives you and the um, and I think it's um, along with the two bracket signs I think they get a ton of branding and I don't think you could anybody could come anywhere near this building without knowing exactly what's going on um, so I think they can dispense with the metal plaques above the piers and and lose absolutely nothing um, so. Um, and I and I really would prefer uh, not to have any uh, mesh signs replacing those. Yeah. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. I'm in agreement with uh, Commissioner Gustafson. Okay, Commissioner Holford Smith. Uh, I'm in agreement, but I I think that um, I also agree with uh, Everardo that we don't need the bracket signs either. I think that the glow from the interior at eye level will be enough to identify this as a TD bank. Okay, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I think the vinyl and blade signs are adequate and there's really no need for uh, any placement of those metal plaques on the building, but other. Uh, well, does it, are, so the, what's before us are the two bracket signs and then the, the metal, three metal square. Right, the three metal squares I think should not. But okay with bracket signs, okay. Yes. Commissioner Goldblum. Um, I uh, think that the flat signs should go. I'm okay with the with the bracket signs, but if others are opposed to them, I would certainly support that resolution. Commissioner Devonshire. The uh, small plaques need to go. Okay, Commissioner Chen. I'm agree with uh, the rest of the commission on plus N, especially Anne's comments. Okay, so that would be no exterior signage. Okay, Commissioner Bland. Yeah, plaques go. I think I can sort of reluctantly uh, accept the brackets. Commissioner Lutfi. Um, I'm okay with the bracket and the plaques should go. Okay. Okay, so I think we have a majority of commissioners supporting the two bracket signs and not approving the uh, plaque signs. So Commissioner Gustafson, would you read that motion? In the, in the matter of LPC 21-01484, 287 Broadway, the 287 Broadway building and individual landmark, the application is to install signage um, I recommend approval with a modification, finding that the proposed work will not eliminate any significant architectural features, 
that the bracket signs will be typical in terms of material and size, compatible with the length of the facades in terms of their number, and placed at a height both compatible with the building design and in compliance with zoning regulations, that the bracket sign at the Broadway facade will be installed at non-historic metalwork, that the bracket sign at the Reed Street facade will be installed at a simply designed portion of the facade, utilizing the minimum necessary penetrations at the historic cast iron, minimizing the impact on historic fabric, that the proposed privacy film will be translucent and feature a neutral dull tone and will only be used at two bays away from the prominent northeast corner of the building and therefore will not diminish the overall sense of transparency or be a prominent presence at the building. And that the cumulative amount and size of the proposed signage will not overwhelm this large corner building. However, I find that the atypical and prominent placement of the proposed metal plaques centered above the piers will draw undue attention to these signs. Therefore, I recommend that the installation of the plaques centered above the piers be omitted from the scope of work. Okay, thank you. And um, Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Okay. And Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Nay. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith. Nay. Okay, with nine in favor and two opposed, the motion carries. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item. The next, the next item is item number five, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, docket number 21-01354, 135th Avenue in the Ladies Mile Historic District, block 820, lot 38, the neo-Renaissance style store and loft building designed by Robert Manicky and built in 1902 to 03. And the application is to replace and modify storefront infill. And commissioners, the applicants have joined the hearing. Uh, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Remember to unmute yourself as well. Thanks, Edith. Um, good morning, commissioners. Erin Ruley, Higgins, Quays, Barth and Partners. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Richard Woodward of GKV Architects. They are the project architects, um, as well as the team from CVS, including uh, David Berman, the director of real estate, Steve Latero of Nevis Architecture, and Arlene Melly of Ultimate Signs. Um, I'll walk you through the um, existing conditions and context, and then Richard uh, will walk you through the design proposal. Um, and then, of course, the whole team will be available uh, for any questions you may have. Uh, the project is located at 130 Fifth uh, Avenue, which is the northwest corner of Fifth Avenue and 18th Streets you see here. It's an 11-story store and loft building designed in 1902-1903 in the neo-Renaissance style um, by Robert Meineke. Um, and the proposal is for new storefront signage and a new entry at the um, uh, ground floor retail space. Um, so here we can see the, the existing condition of the retail space. Uh, Fifth Avenue is on the right here um, and 18th Street uh, storefront locations are on the left. Um, this is the location, this easternmost bay is the location of a new proposed entry uh, for, the, for the store. Um, uh, and as you can see, the, the existing condition is a combination of uh, historic fabric and, and uh, contemporary infill. So the bulkheads, the existing bulkheads um, date to a 1920s alteration, um, as do the, the storefront cornices with this um, uh, spectacular uh, anti-fix cresting at the top. Um, but all of the infill is a uh, 1990s alteration. And so here we see the proposed um, in the context of the overall base. Um, and this includes a new storefront system to accommodate um, insulated glass units. Um, and, and those, um, the storefront is more, uh, more yeah. closely recalls the- um, uh, Oh, I mean, yeah, that, that was reimbursable because- no. uh, More closely recalls the uh, historic configuration and detailing of the storefront. Um, the new entry location is here in this bay. Um, and uh, we'll see in the existing condition photos, there's an existing historic bulkhead in that location. So the proposal is to remove that bulkhead and salvage it and then um, replicate 
the um, the panels at this side, uh, the the flanking walls of the the new um, entry location to create a more um, uh, consistent overall uh, configuration um, with the uh, the existing storefronts. Um, and then there are also three exterior signs located at the at the transoms. Uh, some of the scope that you're going to see is um, approvable at staff level. So that includes uh, freight, new freight doors um, at the, the westernmost bay, um, all of the interior signage and new louvers. Um, also within your um, review is this, um, this interior display wall that you see here. It's that sepia toned wall. That's set back two feet from the from the storefront glazing, um, but because it extends the full width of the of the storefront, it um, it doesn't meet the staff rules. It doesn't obstruct the view into the store, but um, it's the it's the width that that triggers the the full commission review. Um, and and so the the new entry um, includes sliding automatic doors um, for unobstructed access into this very at this very busy corner. Uh, Richard, when he describes the um, the design proposal, can talk about the physical um, constraints of the site um, that recommend this the sliding door system. But beyond that, pharmacies are increasingly providing critical health care services in addition to their traditional business um, and access for disabled disabled um, and other escorted customers uh, that walk side by side through the door um, uh, is uh, that accessibility is, is critical to the to the new use of the space. Um, and as we navigate the COVID crisis, the contact free access is a practical necessity, particularly for uh, healthcare related businesses. Um, the proposal has three primary points that recommend its appropriateness. First, that uh, the well-designed storefront system more closely recalls the historic configuration and detailing, um, and that the new entry is a simple insertion into that storefront that relates to the scale, proportion, um, and detailing of the storefront. Um, and that the proposed entry change is consistent with the commercial changes um, in, in this historic district, which has a long history of commercial reuse and the inherent change that comes with it. Um, from the uh, first generation of buildings, the altered dwellings, to the commercial and retail changes um, as the industries and, and tenancies changed in the larger scale buildings. Um, and this proposed entry is also consistent with other commission approvals um, for heavily trafficked accessible entries, as well as modified entries in the historic district. Um, and so we'll just uh, take a walk around the building and get an understanding of the existing condition. Here is the overall, overall view of the building. Um, on the top right, we see uh, the Fifth Avenue elevation. On the right is the um, primary building entry, um, a storefront in the center. And this is the uh, entry to the, the retail space, the existing entry. And then on the um, bottom, we see 18th Street. So it's four, four bays of storefront. The freight bay is out of view in this um, view in this shot, and uh, this is the bay to be converted for um, uh, the the new entry. And then along 18th Street, we see uh, this is the freight entry again. That's uh, staff level review for the the new doors and louvers in that location. Um, and then a couple of the the bays looking uh, toward the east here. Um, and this is a, more of 18th Street. This is the bay to be converted for the entry. Um, as you can see, here is the existing historic bulkhead. That bulkhead will be salvaged. Um, rather than modifying the existing, um, the proposal is to replicate um, the sort of outside edges of it to create new panels and salvage that in case um, it can be reinstalled in the future um, when it's converted back to a storefront. Um, and uh, here you can see the, the existing uh, storefront cornice that would be retained as well and all of the new entry and fill would occur within this bay. Um, a couple of more details. This is a typical um, storefront bay, uh, historic bulkhead, historic cornice. Um, the, uh, the storefront is divided into three equal panes, uh, which does not match the historic configuration. Um, and the existing transom is a solid um, metal panel. Uh, here we can see the uh, original condition of the building. So um, as I said, the existing storefront, the historic fabric in the existing storefront dates to about 1920. Um, and 
in this historic view, we see the original projecting chamfered storefronts um, and uh, this spectacular signage that rises um, up the, the corner of the building. Um, on the right is a detailed view of the, of the storefronts. Um, and we can see uh, an entry inserted within one of those storefronts, a secondary entry along 18th Street. Um, and uh, 1920s, the tenancy changes in the building. It becomes a bank at the ground floor. And um, uh, the uh, new storefronts are introduced. You can see here they're flush or they're coplanar with the outside edge of the pier at this point. Um, and so this is our, um, in part, what exists today, the bulkhead and the, and the cornices. Um, and the storefront is configured with a, a larger central pane uh, flanked by narrower um, panes there. Uh, we also see new signage on the, the corner pier and um, an array of flagpoles along, along the facade on Fifth Avenue. Um, and then in 1940, the same storefront configuration, but the signage has evolved. And so these changes um, to storefront infill and, and signage are typical in the district um, that is really characterized by commercial reuse and change. Um, this proposal is in the context of other commission approvals for automatic entries uh, with sliding doors um, with other similar conditions such as grocery stores, pharmacies, and healthcare facilities. Uh, these are just three examples. Uh, the CVS at the Brill Building, slider doors there. Um, the recently approved Trader Joe's installation at Bridge Market at the Queensboro Bridge. Um, and on the right, this is um, the new Northwell Center on uh, East 75th Street in the Upper East Side. Um, and so what all of these have in common with 135th is um, that they're highly trafficked uses, providing essential services um, and serving populations that need assistance. Um, all have the practical need for this door type um, and they've been successfully integrated within the infill of these historic buildings. Um, modifying storefronts and entries um, in the Ladies Mile Historic District is, is fairly typical. Um, here we see some examples um, through the introduction of revolving doors and operable storefront systems. Um, and so uh, at the top, we have 695 Sixth Avenue. This is the um, Burlington Coat Factory building, which um, is, is relevant because along 22nd Street, when this was approved, there were um, cast iron bulkheads that were approved for removal to accommodate new windows and new entries, um, including a revolving door system here in this detail. Um, and then at 165th and 126th fifth, where um, uh, revolving doors were integrated into new storefront and secondary entries. Um, and then finally at 857 Broadway, where um, the storefront infill was converted for operability. So neither of these types, the, the revolving door or the operable storefront um, existed historically in store and loft buildings. Um, but over time, the commission has approved um, and recognized that these changes are part of the commercial evolution of the district. Um, and we think that um, a well-designed sliding door system at 130 fits into that, that context fairly neatly. Um, and so now I'll turn it over to Richard to walk you through the specifics of the design proposal. Thank you, Erin. I'm Richard Woodward from GKV Architects. Um, as Erin noted, the building is on the Northwest corner of Fifth Avenue and 18th Street. Uh, the scope of work is replacement of the retail facade, uh, which includes a new replacement door on Fifth Avenue, a new set of sliding doors in the first bay from the corner of 18th Street, uh, new freight entrance doors, and the replacement of the remaining four fixed storefront bays. Next. Um, Fifth Avenue has a very high pedestrian count. A recent study estimated over 30,000 pedestrians per day navigate this block. Uh, CVS is a high volume retailer that will serve the neighborhood. Its pharmacy is a healthcare provider whose customers have the mobility, can have mobility issues, can be encumbered and can need assistance through doors. There's a lot of potential for congestion both on the sidewalk and within the store as customers maneuver in and out of the single entry door on the Fifth Avenue on this busy sidewalk. The new sliding door set on 18th Street will relieve this congestion 
at the Fifth Avenue door and provide a new 44 inch clear door opening. The new and proposed entrances are located adjacent to each other to create the efficiency of a singular interior vestibule. A sliding door is preferred over a swing door as it allows direct access without reversing as the door opens, does not project over the sidewalk and provides a barrier free contactless entry. This slide reinforces the benefits of sliding doors. They're barrier free, accessible, provide a touchless entry and have, and have inherent energy savings. These are the elevations on Fifth Avenue. Uh, the existing condition is on the top and the proposed elevations underneath. The historic bulkhead and cornice are being preserved. The existing metal transom is being replaced with clear glass, which will have an opaque film applied to the interior surface to conceal the interior shutter and ceiling void in the space beyond. The storefront windows will, will be replaced with the mullions respaced to follow more closely the historic condition of a dominant central glazing pane. The central glass side is restricted by manufacturing limitations for insulated double glazed units. The existing non-historic Fifth Avenue entry door is also being replaced and new exterior signage is shown that consists of dimensional letters installed on a channel attached to the mullions. Next, Aaron. This is the 18th Street elevation. Again, the existing condition is on the top and the proposed elevation is underneath. The first bay from the corner is the location of the new sliding doors. The last bay, the last bay shows replacement of the non-historic freight doors, removing a center post. Next. This sheet provides an overview of the full signage program showing exterior signage at transoms as already discussed, as well as interior signage that meets staff rules, including the interior hanging signs and vinyl mounted on the display walls, two feet back from the glazing line. The Pantone colors show the sepia for the vinyl with the freight entry side panels, the interior window uh, graphics, um, the bronze for the storefront framing and dark gray for the opaque film inside the transom glass. Next. This is a detailed elevation of the existing storefront and the new sliding doors. The three part metal sliding door set will have a finish to match the storefronts. It will read as a simple insertion within the existing opening. The historic bulkhead for this bay will be salvaged with new panels replicated in aluminum for the side infills. An applied decorative profile will be added to the new frame to match the new storefronts. Next. Uh, this is a detailed section through the new doors shown the exterior signage at the transom uh, and sliding doors. This is a proposed typical storefront. Um, sorry, this is an exist, this is an existing storefront bay, uh, which shows equally spaced storefront windows. And um, the proposed typical storefront, the project restores the historic hierarchy of the storefront windows. The center bay will be nine feet wide, flanked by 5411 side, side windows, working with the limitations of the insulated glass. We're getting closer to the historic condition and configuration and improving on the existing geometry. The existing metal transoms will be removed and replaced with clear glass with opaque gray film applied to the interior surface. And the signage at the transom are dimensional letters mounted to a channel that's attached to the mullions. They will, they will project approximately two and a quarter inches beyond the mullions and the channel will be the same color as the transom 
to minimize its visual impact. Um, if you go back one, Aaron, the existing display wall was full height, as you can see on the, on the left. Uh, we're improving the situation. The new, situ the new display wall will be 30 inches above the bulkhead on 18th Street, which allows for restored views into the store. We're preserving the historic corners and bulkheads and the existing security gate and new ceiling will remain behind the transom, hence the applied film on the interior. Next. Storefront details show uh, new frame and mullions using a decorative trim around the perimeter and transoms. Next. A decorative metal profile is being applied over the storefront frame and transom as a historic reference. Next. This is a section through the Fifth Avenue storefront, which is similar to the 18th Street, but the interior display wall is shorter in this elevation, down from 30 inches to 18 inches on this facade. Uh, the Fifth Avenue entrance showing the proposed replacement of the non-historic door and adjacent glazing. And so in summary, the replacement of the historic windows improves the existing condition to bring it closer to the historic. The installation of new sliding doors on 18th Street will read as a minimal insertion into the historic opening while providing necessary accessibility for all retail clients including those with mobility issues. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have any questions, commissioners? If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi, please go ahead. Um, in terms of the uh, CVS logo, isn't it, doesn't it normally appear at, you know, as you have it in the windows in red, I'm just wondering why it's white on the transom signage. Uh, this is Dave Berman from CBS. Um, we can make that red if that's preferred. Um, we were trying to be uh, less uh, loud as far as the signage goes and uh, keep it a little bit more subdued, but uh, at least that was our intent. Okay, thank you. Okay, and a, a follow up to that those those are those channel letters with an acrylic face. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yes, I wondered if uh, the architect had considered um, having automatically operable swing doors instead of the sliding doors. I understand why you want to have uh, automatic doors, but was that considered at all? Steve, do you want to take that question? You might be muted. Uh, no. Yeah, this is Dave. Um, it's my understanding with the swing doors, it's a little bit more cumbersome uh, to uh, press a button and then back up and then enter. This was the easiest uh, way to access the store uh, without touching anything. Um, we have done this, obviously, at the Brill Building. Uh, we've done it at the New School, which is not landmark, but it's one of the greenest buildings in Manhattan. And we uh, very artfully matched uh, the facade and uh, the hardware and everything that we had to do. And the landlord was very pleased at the end. There also was concerned uh, prior to. So we're able to do that uh, very well. And uh, we feel it's just the easiest access uh, for our customers. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, Steve, you're good. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. This is uh, Steve Letaro from Nevis Architecture. Uh, another uh, a point is uh, having uh, swinging doors, we would have to recess those a minimum of 18 inches uh, behind the storefront so that we don't project over the property line. Um, and we, like we said, we, that would require some sort of a push button type 
actu actuation to operate. Um, there would be a, a, an additional landing uh, landing required inside the vestibule in order to accommodate those doors uh, because there is a slight uh, elevation difference between the sidewalk and the vestibule. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Jefferson, and just remember, you'll have to accept my request to unmute you. Uh, you keep mentioning the historic proportions of the, the glass. What is the historic proportion of the glass? Um, right now, you say you changed it to, uh, to get closer to the historic proportion. I'm curious what the historic proportions were. So those were, let's see if I can get back to the historic photograph. They essentially aligned with the panels in the bulkhead. So if you see here, these, um, each of these three sections within the bulkhead, um, the, the panels aligned there. And we can see that in, let's see, let me get back to the historic photo for you. Oh, here we go. Um, so here, the, this, you see the broad central uh, pane and then the, the narrower side planes. And we think that they did align with the, the bulkhead below. And the issue here is that the, um, the largest available um, insulated glass unit is limited by nine feet. And I, I'll defer to, um, to Richard on that, but um, it's a limiting size. So the idea was to restore the hierarchy of those parts so that the, the center pane is the largest and then the, um, the flanking planes are, panes are narrower. Yes, it's nine feet in one dimension. Unfortunately, the height is just over 10 feet, so we couldn't run it sideways and have a, a longer span. Thank there you. Was, there was a limitation. Thank you. Okay, other questions, commissioners? Okay, I think we don't have any other questions at this time, so we will move to public testimony. And if, again, if you're in the meeting and would like to speak, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And I'll turn it over to Lisa to walk us through the testimony. Okay, we had one person sign up, uh, Simeon Bankoff, and you should be all set. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Simeon Bankoff, the Star District's Council. This is a re remarkably elegant Robert Meineke building. Uh, HTC's Public Review Committee took no issue with the proposal to replace and modify the storefront infill, but felt the proposed signage program was much too much. The Fifth Avenue facade does not require two signs. The interior lit sign is sufficient for pedestrian identification. Similar, similarly, the 18th Street facade has an overabundance of signage. The sign in the sign band over the easternmost bay is almost confusing in that it competes with an entrance to the west. Given the brand identity and interior advertising program, less is more in terms of signage on the storefront. And the interior signage is more than sufficient to guide the destination shopper to the store. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else would like to speak? Please raise your hand. Okay, I think that's it for testimony. Okay, thank you. And Rich, do we have any written testimony? We do. We have a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 5 uh, recommending denial of the application stating that the sliding doors were out of character with the Lady Smile Historic District. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'd like to turn back to the applicant team and ask if you'd like to respond to any of the comments. Sure, thank you, Chair. Um, the, uh, I think that the historic, the comment that Simeon raised about the historic, si the existing signage, that, that the proposal is, is in the context of what was there historically. There was a, an abundance of signage on the building through the various um, uh, iterations of, of retail and, and store and loft use there. Um, and uh, with regard to the community board, I'm not sure if I mentioned it earlier, but we did make some changes following the community board meeting, including reducing the size of the signage and changing the, the palette for that, um, the interior display wall to be more um, uh, consistent with the, the overall aesthetic of the, of the storefront. Um, but uh, with regard to the, to the modernity of the uh, uh, door installation. I think the, the architects have worked very hard to try to um, uh, uh, 
accommodate or insert the, the, um, the doors within uh, a, a typical storefront configuration. And so there's a, a very legible reading of uh, top rail and bottom rail. There are uh, molded profiles added to the, the, the transom bar, which houses the mechanics of the door. Um, and that um, there wouldn't actually be all that much of an appreciable difference uh, aesthetically between this and uh, aluminum, paired aluminum swing doors. Um, and there is a tremendous value in terms of the, the difference in terms of operation and um, accessibility in, in terms of maneuvering around the door and having an actuator um, on that very busy corner. Okay. Thank you. Commissioners, any final questions? All right, I'm going to start uh, unmuting or requesting to unmute you so that we can close the hearing and move to our discussion. All right, Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? A motion to close the hearing. And Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? I second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, Commissioner Lutfi, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, I think I'm gonna just start with the signage. There, there really is way too much signage on this uh, facade. <clears throat> Um, and whatever there is, I, I feel like it should be consistent um, in terms of color with the with the brand logo. But to to have signage on the transoms and in the windows and you know slightly step back in the store, it's just like a cacophony of uh, of uh, of messaging and signs. And I think that. Um, CVS customers and anyone walking down the street, if you place your signage in appropriately in appropriate locations on the Broadway side and the uh, is it the other the other side of the building, people are going to see it. Um, it's not a brand that doesn't have a strong presence throughout the city and in our you know everyday lives. So I think that's very important. Um, in terms of the doors, I, I think it's worth exploring to see if um, the applicant can do something to come up with a door that's more compatible with the uh, architecture of the building. Um, I appreciate some of the, the concerns that they raised, but um, I think it would be good if they go back to the drawing board. Okay, all right, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. Oh, I, I think it's appropriate. I think the, the doors make sense. I mean, if putting in, technically it makes sense. Um, I think I agree with the signage issue, too much signs. But I think the door, uh, I'm not sure how they would solve it technically, but it's up to, up to them. Um, so I, I think too much signage and the door was fine with me, but if it could make it simpler, would be fine with me too. So I'm some, okay. some Thank you. All right, Commissioner Gustafson. Uh, I'm okay. I'm okay with the uh, with the sliding doors. The um, uh, there is something I do agree with Commissioner Lutfi that there is something about the the white CVS pharmacy signage that is just um, I, I I can't put my finger on it, but it's not quite right in in their um, in the context of their uh, of their branding, and therefore it sort of jumps out at you in a way that makes it stark. Um, I, I don't know what the solution to that is, but um, uh, other than that, I'm fine with it. All right, and, and just following up on that in terms of the, it will be white acrylic with a light coming through it, which um, is also a material that I think we've been uh, rather selective in our approvals of. And so if it were a backlit sign or a halo sign, <coughs> would a different material change that for you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I, I don't think there should be any signage in that location at all, not channel or other material. I think there is sufficient signage from within and uh, on, the, on the, the wall of the windows themselves. 
and um, and just the reading on the corner. It, it's a, an incredibly visible corner. So and everywhere you are, whether it's on Fifth or across the street uh, on 18th, you're aware of the entire thing as CVS. I mean, it, it's we've been trained to understand banks and pharmacies. So uh, I, I don't think there should be any signage up there. And it also competes, I think, with the ornamental material above. So uh, otherwise, I can approve the sliding doors as they've been presented here. Commissioner Holford Smith. Sorry, muted. Um, I agree with um, Adi on the exterior signage in the in the transom. I don't think it's necessary, and I think that um, the red lit signs on the interior will certainly uh, mark the location of this CBS very well. Um, I don't really find that the sliding doors are appropriate, but I understand that the alternatives are, are much more difficult to work into the design of the uh, storefront. So a majority uh, is for them, then I can accept the sliding doors. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I think I can go along with the uh, use of the sliding doors. Um, I'm familiar with obviously both type of operations on pharmacies, uh, but <clears throat> it is true that they would have to put some kind of a you know, uh, touch uh, uh, thing to open the doors if they were uh, not the sliding doors. And that's, uh, will, you know, cre create an additional visual thing as well as a physical thing. In any event, on the signage issue, um, it does seem somewhat cluttered. <laughs> and um, it, I think in some ways, I think the, the best thing actually might be to have the red, uh, the current, current acrylic be another, probably in, perhaps another material and certainly red. And perhaps the window signage, I guess, is uh, a lot of it is actually um, they could have, uh, though I I think that design just looks cluttered is the problem. And that's why I've been sort of reacting that way, even though we've seen more signage where, you know, every window has a sign and then you have up, up above signage. So I'm not sure exactly what should be done about it, but I agree that the white signage is uh, not appropriate. Thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. All right, thank you. Um, second signage on an old building in a row, um, interesting. Um, I mean, the funny thing is that it's true. These buildings had so much signage on them in, the, in, in their day. And so I'm trying to think about why is this not feeling right? And I think that it has something to do with obviously the, the styles of the, of the, and the materials from which the letters are made. So they somehow uh, lent to a historic streetscape that we associate with historic images, whereas plexiglass, sans serif, internally illuminated letters don't. <laughs> um, I don't believe they actually intended the, the white ones to be illuminated, but they are, I think, I think you're right, Sarah, the, the materiality of them, the fact that they're two inches deep, very thick. When you're seeing this, this, this rendering, you're seeing not only the faces, but that depth. <laughs> and that depth makes them very clunky. Uh, we, uh, I would be fine. I mean, I think if you look at the way that contemporary signage works in this area, it does occur on the facade in this band over the over the uh, you know over the windows and doors. But I think that the placement of the white signs and even their size is not inappropriate. Um, but I think the materiality is completely inappropriate. It should be a flat plate aluminum or painted steel with a halo lighting or no lighting at all. And I think that if we're going to keep the um, signage on the facade, then the interior signage should not be there. I also think that the that little brown knee wall with the, with the kind of the B-shaped decor, decor on it, I think that it's inappropriate. I think it just lends to visual clutter uh, on the on the store. You know, there's going to be enough eye eye irritation from all the displays. I don't think that the patterning. Um, contributes anything at all to the historic district and should be 
removed. I have no problem at all with the sliding doors, primarily because the, um, the alternate would be a significant three-dimensional modification of the storefront in order to ingress the doors for code. And I think this is better. Thank you, Commissioner Devonshire. Um, I'm okay with the sliding doors. I, I agree with Adi and Ann about the signage. I, there's sufficient signage on the interior of these windows. They don't need it on the outside. Okay. Sarah, can I just add real quick? Yes. I, I think just in reference to what um, Michael Goldblum just asked about why the signage reads in such a kind of in contrast to the historic um, it, it's the historic photographs uh, documenting these building, the retail on these buildings. I think that we have to take into account the uh, fluorescent lighting that mm. happened. I mean, and I don't know that we can account, you know, how it is that we deal with that because it's well, you know, beyond our two feet or whatever it is. But I think that that's both in the case of the banks, but especially in the case of these pharmacies and the. Uh, whether they're 24 hours or in some cases not, that's a real issue. And it adds, I think, to the, to the experience of the signage and of the presence of this program in these buildings. Where is the hook part? Thank you. All right, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I'm sort of like uh, a lot of commissioners uh, have this ambivalence and, and struggling with it. I'm trying to picture um, what, what, why am I having a problem with both this case and the TD Bank case, uh, and you know the historic nature of of, of this uh, important um, uh, avenue, and 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 I think it's because you know is is as some commissioner said, you know we know by now these corners are all being dominated by banks and chain stores, so it lacks that individuality of the old days where we can tell the the the, the characters, and so I. I I, I sympathize with both 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 of these cases in terms of community board and how they reacted, and and I uh, you know that the um, and so I think that uh, some of the commissioners' point is well taken, meaning that you know uh, th these are well known brand, and so the, the amount of signage and the amount of uh, that is needed may not be as necessary, but I I will go along with the majority. I think I reluctantly had to accept the sliding door. Um, on such a prominent corner, I think this is a very, they're going to draw a lot of foot traffic and, and uh, um, as a result of this, uh, but, you know, as, as in general, I just feel that, you know, like whether Saratoga Springs or anything, the, all the main street are facing this issue of pharmacies and banks taking over corners like these and, and the brand and what do we deal with the color, what do we do with the, uh, the rest of them. Yes. Commissioner Bland. Um, thank you. Um, I'm okay with the doors. I think it's been expressed um, enough and I'm, I'm happy with the doors. I, I think the alternative is much worse, so I can accept it. Um, I think uh, the issue of the signage is, 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 em is emerging around the table as a very interesting discussion and I want to, I want to address it my, in my way too. Um, <clears throat> I think um, Commissioner Lutfi nailed it when she said cacophony. And in this case, it's a cacophony. And, and one might say about all of these historic photos, which all of these applicants over my now 12 years or so in the commission bring to us and say, look, they don't use the word cacophony, but they almost use words to say, look, the buildings are covered with signage. And therefore, signage is OK now, isn't it? Well, I've never bought that uh, idea. I, I hope that applicants will stop using it so reflectively uh, to, to, to say, because in, in the past, uh, current signage is okay. And I think um, um, Addie really began to nail it when she said, yes, but what about all the lit signage? And, um, and Wellington nailed it further when he said, and it's all generic and it's all, uh, you know, it's no longer kind of artistic or interesting or offbeat signage, it's just out of uh, catalogs, out of national brands and so forth. So I think, <clears throat> excuse me, this is what begins to separate out the appropriateness, which might have existed in another day. Um, there was no commission to say yes or no, of course, it just mm -hmm. happened. 
whether it was appropriate or not. And maybe it wasn't always so appropriate uh, either. Uh, it just happened. Uh, and there was other way, there were, that was the way then to announce and brand. I think there are many other ways to do it today. Anyway, I think it's a very interesting and complicated subject and I don't mean to try to resolve it on this case right now. But back to cacophony, Jeannie nailed it. Cacophony this is, and I think somehow we have to, we have to settle all this down a bit in this case. Uh, I think I do agree that maybe nothing should be up on those transoms and maybe nothing should be on the, on the building at all. I mean, it can be done so effectively from inside the store and maybe that's something. But anyway, this is not appropriate and thank you for allowing me. And all of the other commissioners who have brought this to the fore, I think this should be an interesting dialogue that we begin to have with these, um, with these examples and try to come to a better conclusion than we often have by just saying, okay, because it's, it was done a hundred years ago, we can do it now with our own signage. I don't accept that. I don't think that's, that's, that's the right precedent. <clears throat> okay, thank you. So I think you know we do have uh, the majority of the commissioners supporting the doors. I think the doors are fine. And I think um, that the signage is the main issue here. And it is true. It is something that the commission historically has always, um, I think, ha struggled with signage. And while we know historically buildings were often, particularly buildings that historically were of commercial uses, were covered in signs, the commission has never taken that approach. And I think that it's true, you know, thinking about this discussion that in large part, that's because the types of signs are so different and they don't have the same feeling. And then also, I think even if buildings were historically covered with signage, people today would find that that covers architectural features. So I think um, we won't take an action today and the applicants should work with the staff to think about how they can um, Restudy the signage, both in terms of the amount of it, the type of it, and um, the combination of types, and sort of, I think, pulling all of those things together to have an overall reduction in um, the the uh, effect on the historic building, and and um, with that, we'll. Uh, take no action and we'll ask you to continue to work with the staff and we'll see you back when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Thank you, commissioners. All right, commissioners, we'll move on to item number six, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, DACA number 21-01103. 26 East 95th Street in the Upper West Side Central Park West Historic District, um, Block 1208, Lot 45, an altered Renaissance Revival style row house designed by Neville and Bag and built in 1892 to 93. Application is to construct rooftop and rear yard additions and a street. And commissioners, the applicants have joined the hearing. Uh, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Hello, commissioners and staff. My name is Jackie Prudu Vallon. I am the preservation consultant for this project. Thank you for hearing our application today. Um, as was already described, this is a uh, late 19th century row house, which stands on the south side of the street between Central Park West and Columbus Avenue. Um, I should also mention, I'm also here with the architect who is Chris Menziuso of Grasso Menziuso Architects, as well as the owner who is Asaf Dror. Um, Okay, looking at this slide, does this work? Are you seeing my arrow? Okay, in the 1920s, the facade of the house was stripped. You can see uh, its current condition in the photo to the left. Recently, LPC issued a permit to restore the front facade with a staff level permit. Here in this photo, you see the house in its current condition. Um, and next to it uh, is the front, the, uh, that restoration I just referred to. Uh, with one exception, which is the proposed straight stoop that we're asking you to consider today. The proposal we're asking you to consider today is the straight stoop, a rooftop addition, and a rear addition.
Okay, here's the house's location and the northern end of the historic district, as well as some photos of what the rest of the south side of the block looks like. And here are photos of the north side of the street, which is characterized by row houses in a variety of revival styles. Here uh, are historic photos. Uh, here on the left is the earliest photo we could locate of 26 West 95th Street. It was built as part of a row with 28 to 32, the photos you see at center uh, from the 1930s. Um, again, as I mentioned in the 1920s, this facade was, was stripped. And uh, you'll also note that these houses originally had box stoops. The permit that was recently issued included restoring the box stoop on number 26. However, we must ask you commissioners today to now consider approving a straight stoop on this house. The reason we ask for this change is because DOT requires there be a five foot clearance between the existing tree pit and the stoop. This is for ADA compliance. Uh, with the correct restored box stoop, we would not have the necessary five foot clearance with the tree pit, as you can see in the plan at right. So here's what we originally proposed to Landmarks and what we found out later from Department of uh, Transportation, um, we would not be able to build. So for that reason, we are coming to you today with this straight stoop seen in plan over here. Here are detailed drawings for the proposed straight stoop. It would be finished with the same rustication and details and newel post as the historic. Here are partial elevations comparing the propo proposed straight stoop and the box stoop. This is a study showing where the closest nearby tree pits are. It also shows how the straight stoop and areaway walls will have to be set back about 10 inches from the plane of the existing adjacent stoop walls to get the necessary clearance. These are photographs of the south side of the street, again, to show where the other nearby tree pits are and where the other nearby stoops are. Please note that while the, the row this house belongs to has a united incursion into the street, it is a varied streetscape with, street, with straight stoops at, at other houses. There's a straight stoop at the adjacent house just to the left of number 26. There are also straight stoops to the east at 18, 14, 12, 8, and 6, and to the west at numbers 40, 42, and 44. And now moving on to the rooftop addition. Uh, here's a close-up elevation of the proposed rooftop addition, which will be one story of occupiable space with a stair bulkhead on top of it. At the front, it will be finished in brownstone stucco and will have a glass railing. At the rear and sides, it will be finished in real brick and will have metal railings. Here are the existing and proposed roof plans. The addition will be set back almost 13 feet from the front facade. Here are photos of the existing roof and an axon that shows the proposed additions. Here are sections through the existing proposed roofs showing you the line of sight from across the street and showing you that this addition will not be visible from across the street. Here are photos of the mock-up uh, at the roof. Here are photos taken from the east and west on 95th Street demonstrating that the mock-up is not visible from the street. Here's a photo of the existing rear facade. Now moving on to the rear. So the existing rear facade has an existing L. And here is the existing, uh, existing elevation, proposed elevation. The proposal at the rear is to square off the existing L, creating a three-story full width addition. The third floor rear facade will remain the same. The outer brick piers will be maintained at the lower floors. A metal railing will be installed at the first and third floors and at the roofs. Here's the proposed rear addition in context with its neighboring houses. And here are photos again of the existing uh, rear elevation. And here are photos of the existing neighboring rear additions, which are uniformly three stories in height. Here's a photo of the interior of the block or donut. In the photo on the left, I'd like you to please note that 
across the interior and just to the east of this house, there are a pair of houses that have one story structures built in their backyards. That's this here. Um, I point these out to show that there are already incursions within the block that are very close to this house. This is 27, 27 and 29 West 94th Street, which also has a sizable rooftop addition that sizes, that, um, excuse me, that spans both houses. There's also a large rooftop addition on top of 25 West 94th Street, which is next to them. And now here's a couple of sheets of historic and current Sanborn maps, uh, just in case you wanna look at the evolution of this block. And here is the current color-coded block plan. Um, the existing block plan color-coded color to show you where there are rear and rooftop additions. Please note that the one-story structures are shown in purple. Also, please note the full width three-story additions that the commission has previously approved are at 6 and 44 West 95th Street. The rooftop additions previously approved by the commission are also noted at 44 and 34 West 90, 95th Street. Um, this is the end of our most salient slides. So I'm just gonna kind of breeze through the remainder. Please stop me if you have questions. Um, building section, uh, the existing uh, volume outlined in red. Um, cellar plans, basement plans, showing you change at the rear yard, um, showing the addition and the, and the stair and patio going to the rear yard. This is how the um, elevations will change at the rear yard. Fence, existing rear yard. Um, I was instructed by staff that the, the deck and rear yard changes and fence would really be at staff level. So that's why I'm not going through them quickly, but please do let me know if you have questions. And I just wanna end, end on this slide so you can have a recap of how the volume is changing and what the proposal is at the front and rear. And I'm happy to take questions and comments. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. All right, and I think we do have a few questions. Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Just accept my request to unmute you. Um, could you could you could you go back to the slide that shows the your addition to the backyard, how much more you're adding on? I'm a little confused. Okay, do you want to see that in plan or in elevation? In, in plan. So the oh, okay. plan. So you had another slide that showed right. So how much more you're, you're adding on this uh, ele so on the so here I'll, sorry go ahead help me with the alignment so you're only you're only filling in the the piece that's missing of the L piece at the back right Is that what yes you're yes that's correct you're so it's going, just you're not going any further into the donut correct the addition itself will just be squaring off the the existing L. Right, okay, which is you. removing only your own, blocking your, only your own window. Okay. Yes. Because then you meet the other L. Yes. Okay. All right. I had a question about the stoop. In I know you showed the photographs that showed that um, there were some existing box-shaped stoops, L-shaped stoops, and some straight stoops. Are they all in the same row? And did the row historically have a pattern of mix of straight and box right. stoops? The row, sorry, I'm still trying to get there. Okay, so the row, this house was originally identical to the houses you see in the center photograph here. So originally the row entirely had box stoops. Um, so what we're proposing to meet DOT requirements is the straight stoop that has details that match uh, you know, at the sides, the details would match these box stoops, but it would be a straight run stoop instead. Okay, so mm -hmm. the straight run stoop mm -hmm. to the left of your building, is yes. that, that's a non-historic stoop or is it not in the tax photo? Sorry. That, um, that was a stoop that was actually, um, I believe it was in the 1930s photo, it was there. By designation, it was not there anymore, and it has since been restored. Okay. So that it, stoop at number 24 got a permit from Landmarks within the last 20 years and was restored. 
I see, but it actually does look like it's part of a different row. It yeah. is that house, that house number okay. 24 and to the east is a different row. Okay, thank you. All right, any other uh, questions, commissioners? Okay, we'll move to public testimony. So if you're here and would like to speak, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Lisa who will start with anyone who signed in in advance. Lisa. So I think Elisa had to step away. Uh, Anthony is going to be handling the bringing okay. of, of testimony. Right. Thank you. Okay, um, one second. We do have a couple of hands raised. Um, so I, we will move on to So Young Lee. Having issues allowing her in. Rich, are you able to let her in? Um, I'm for some reason it's not allowing me to. Yeah, I will attempt to bring her in. Hello. Oh, there she is. Hi. Hi, so young guys, please state your name for the record and you have three minutes. Hi, uh, my name is So Young Lee and have been in her block for more than 10 years. As the owner of 24 West 95th Street, I'm directly impacted by the extension project of house number 26. The proposed extension is very unique compared to other extension in our block in ways that could endanger not only our property, but also the historic character of our block. If approved, it will set a precedent that will potentially impact every townhouse in our block. It is a massive extension, which will add almost 2,000 square foot to the house. Historically, townhouses around our block have undergone construction for either maximum two-story extension or a rooftop addition. However, uniquely number 26 is aiming to extend the basement, first, second, third floor, and the rooftop addition which is an extremely large project and which will take a lot of sun and airflow from my property, invade privacy and degrade our property value. Furthermore, it will close the gap between our home and number 26, which has acted as a necessary bumper for the noise and privacy. Additionally, extension of house number 26's third floor will press up against our third floor balcony, not only block blocking out sun and airflow, but also raising security concerns as it'll give them uniquely easy access onto our balcony. And their rooftop addition will also block daylight to our property. Until now, the south side of our, of our block has had only two houses with the backyard extensions, number 44 and number six, which were approved in 2017. Both of these houses were at the tail ends of our street. In the case of number 44, it is between two co-op buildings and therefore has no negative impact on their neighboring buildings. Similarly, number six extended itself out toward its adjacent co-op buildings with a far less negative impact on its neighboring townhouse. In contrast, the proposed e extension of number 26 is different. Number 26 is located in the middle of our block and is between two townhouses. This extension will not only impair the historic charm of brownstone, but will also introduce noise, dust, and disruption to our block in the middle of pandemic. It is only this excessive unusual part of this project I object, not the whole project. If this excessive aspects get approved, it can set a bad precedent for the similar or bigger projects, which do not only impair quality of a life of neighboring houses, but also change the historic character of the block. Thank you. Next, we have Michelle Parker. Rich, I am having issues again. <laughs> you Hold on. Uh, just saw her come in. Hey, you guys, I can do this. I've promoted her and I can keep promoting her uh, going forward. Family. Okay. Uh, to family. Okay. 
Uh, shall I start? Yes, please state your name for the record and you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Michelle Parker. I am the co-chair of the Preservation Committee of CB7, the site of this application. This resolution comes to you as a committee resolution as it appears on our full board uh, agenda this evening. Our full board meeting is this evening, but we thank you for giving us permission to submit this committee resolution to you. The Preservation Committee recommends approval of this application. We found that the scale and materials of the rooftop are not obtrusive and it is not visible from the public way. We are happy that the front stoop will be replaced. The front stoop and the cornices will be replaced. It might be better if the scoop, scoop oh, excuse me, stoop could be a box stoop to reflect its, the historical character of the building even if it needs to be scaled down to fit within the ADA requirements. But as you can see in the 1990s photo, there's a tree that's taller than the building now. And what has to be considered is the health of the tree, among other things, if the tree pit were altered. Uh, for the rear facade, we're very happy. They're leaving the top floor as is. We found that the basement and parlor floor windows are well within the scope. Uh, that is routinely approved and that there's a generous amount of masonry surrounding the windows and between the floors. We found the rear yard excavation to be modest. And we appreciate that the applicant was willing, the applicant personally and the people working on this project will be, were willing to compromise with the preservation committee and adopt our recommend, recommendations to wit to substitute metal railings instead of glass to consider a box stoop while respecting the ADA, LPC, DOT, and parks requirements, and the installation of these semi-permeable planters in the backyard, we found, uh, we, we, we are happy that they considered that, uh, our, that recommendation. Thank you very much. Mark, do you want to keep calling up people? I can call in. Who's next? Why don't you call them and I'll move them, okay? Okay. Next, we have Sean Corsandy from Landmark West. I'm bringing him in. All right, Sean, please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Sean Corsandi for Landmark West. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee is excited to see all of the attention paid to replicating this long lost facade. This exactitude further confuses the rationale for creating a fictional stoop, whereas similar dimensions and details for the original box stoop in a row of original box stoops readily exist. The complicating factor seems to be a neighbor's pre existing two foot 11 inch pinch point which would no further be exasperated by a true proper reconstruction. Similarly, if one can justify a 10 inch setback for a straight stoop, a box stoop of similar 10 inch setback compressing the assembly would be more cohesive to the row and the architect's original intent. On the reverse facade, as seen on sheet 23, if approved, this rear yard would be the only full width addition to this otherwise intact donut. Both of those, uh, only the third, excuse me. Both of those offending instances approved in 2017 are on end row houses adjacent to larger avenue buildings, whereas this landmark row house is centrally located mid-block and would have a greater impact on its neighbors. The Landmark West Certificate of Appropriateness Committee urges the commission to consider the architect's intent for this row, both publicly on the street and semi-publicly on the rear yard and seek modifications to the proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And next we have Simeon Bankoff from Historic Districts Council. Okay, Simeon, you have three minutes. Please say your name for the record. Good afternoon, Simeon Bankoff, Historic Districts Council. For the purposes of, of disclosure, uh, Jackie Poudvalon is a frequent participant in HTC's Public Review Committee and presented this proposal to us before recusing herself 
from our discussion of it. We very much appreciate the explanation and background she provided. Um, HTC understands the circumstances necessitating the configuration of the new stoop, and while we would prefer that they were not a factor in the reconstruction of this architectural feature, the stoop as proposed is well designed and suited for the building. We have no position on the proposed rooftop addition as it appears largely invisible from the public way. However, we find that the proposed three-story full width rear yard addition to be much too bulky to be appropriate. There is little precedence within the garden core of this block for such a large addition, especially one which is a full three stories in height. This is a stupendous addition to the backyards of the block and not in a good way. HCC urges the Landmarks Commission to instruct the applicants to lessen their ambitious program for the, back, for the rear yard and shrink this proposal down to a size suited for this block and this building. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I see no other hands raised and no other signups. Thank you. And, and uh, no, written test no other written testimony. We do have two letters that came in just a short while ago in opposition from neighbors. Okay, thank you. All right, um, Jackie, would you like to respond to the testimony? Yes, please. And I think after I give a response, I believe the architect and the owner would also like to speak as well, please. Sure. So um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for their very thoughtful testimony. Thank you for the points they've, they've raised. Um, first off, addressing the stoop reconstruction, um, we honestly wish we were not here asking the commissioners to approve a straight stoop. Um, the owner does prefer to have a box stoop. However, um, we've really hit an impasse with other city agencies on this issue. So um, it was, and maybe Mark wants to jump in on this too, if he feels appropriate. But um, um, C Commission Council was also speaking to other city agencies on our behalf about this. and. Uh, we came to the conclusion that our only um, our only option was to see if commissioners would approve a straight stoop on this house because of this issue of ADA clearance on the sidewalk. Um, secondly, moving on to the issue of the bulk and the size of the rear addition, this again is just squaring off an existing L. So it's really only adding about 650 square feet at the back of this house. It's not creating an incursion that's any deeper into the green space than the, the line of the existing L addition. Um, it's, and it's also not a pristine block interior to begin with. Um, as we showed in the presentation, there are very close to this house, one story structures that are built at the rear of, uh, of the lots at, um, numbers 27 and 29 West 94th Street. So those pretty much back up to the backyard of this house. Um, so there are already uh, incursions within the interior green space that are very close to this house. There are also uh, full width rear additions that have already been approved within this block by the commission. One at number six and one three story full width addition at number 44 um, West 95th Street. Um, let's see. I had anything else I wanted to say. Um, with that, I think I'd like to ask the architect and the owner if they would like to speak as well addressing these concerns. I think I'm going to so, yield first to the owner. This is Chris Menzuso, the architect, to allow him to speak. And then if necessary, I can jump in. Hello, everyone. My name is Asaf Roar. I'm the owner of the building at 26 West 95th Street. It's a pleasure to speak with all of you. And I thank you all for your time uh, today. Um, just to basically add a little bit to Jackie's uh, presentation and, and remarks, um, the 650 square feet is a total addition that includes the rear and closing of the L plus the rooftop addition on top. It's not just the, the enclosure and, and the rear. So it, 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 as opposed to what was stated by our neighbor at 24 West 95th Street, uh, we are not increasing the square footage by 2,000 square feet, we're only increasing the total square footage by approximately 650 square feet. And that basically is enclosing the L in addition to adding the rooftop addition on top, which is set back both in the front and the rear. Um, just uh, with re regards to uh, answering with the box stoop, 
our intention and our preference is a box stoop. We've applied two landmarks for a box stoop initially, and we've gotten approval for a box stoop. That was our preference, and that's what we wanted to do. Unfortunately, um, there was no way for us to build this box stoop and, and, and uh, basically comply with the Department of Transportation requirements even if we had to base, move the back stoop and push it towards us, it would have to be pushed back by over two feet or close to two feet, I should say, I'm not exactly sure. In which case we would not even have enough room to walk into the, into the stoop, into our house. So as much as we wanted to have the box stoop, unfortunately we could not, we, we do want a stoop. I think it's very important for us to have a stoop. I think it's very important for the building to have a stoop. It's important for us to enter the building and, and from, from the parlor floor to our house. And that's our intention. Um, with regards to uh, other buildings in the area, uh, 44 West 95th Street was recently approved and recently completed by, uh, was recently approved by LPC and recently completed by the owner. And that is almost an identical application to ours, whereby he enclosed the rear L three story and he also added the uh, rooftop addition with the setbacks. Uh, which is not seen from the street. So that application is very, I should say identical really to our application at the 44 West 95th application is identical really, give or take a couple of inches to our application at 26 West 95th Street. That's really all I have to say. And again, I wanna thank you very much for all your uh, cooperation and attendance tonight. today. Um, hey, Sarah. Yes. I can make it just a few comments just to sort of uh, fill in some of the stuff on the stoop issue. There were extensive discussions with parks and DOT about the requirements for the stoop and due to ADA requirements, um, the box stoop is does not fit in there, would have to be substantially you know, uh, moved away as, as was stated. In addition, um, the only way that, DO, that the parks will allow a tree pit to be moved if it is impossible to, um, to, there's no other possibility for the work. And so they would require the commission to vote against uh, a straight stoop uh, before they could, they will, are able to sort of look at alternatives. And even when there are alternatives, there are incredibly significant uh, financial um, obligations for uh, removing a tree and planting other trees and all sorts of things. And um, so I think in some ways it, they're so significant that the that it would make no sense for this owner to move forward with the stoop. Um, there's, it's just, you know, they're very significant financial disincentives. So um, that's the story. Uh, it, I'm happy to answer any questions that commissioners have. Okay, thank you. All right, and I just had one question on the rooftop addition. I saw on the elevation, it looks like it was on in elevation 10 foot four above something. I'm not sure if that's the roof, roof line, um, but could you speak to the overall height of the addition and the floor to ceiling height inside and, um, and then just confirm your setbacks from the rear? Okay. I think it would be best for Chris, the architect, to take this question. Sure, I, I don't have control of the slides. I like to go back to the slides and section. Do I have, who has control? Uh, Jackie, you still do. I do, okay. I'm trying, hold on. Click on it. I'm clicking. Then... I just went too far. There you go. Now I'm in the, I'm going the wrong way. Why can't I control this? Does someone want to take control from me? Because I clearly don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, you, you just have to go up on the uh, arrow keys to go backwards. Oh, thank you. Okay, Chris, where do you want me to go here? Yeah, we, we, can, we can start with this one. So uh, the first part of the enlargement is 10 foot four, that's floor to ceiling. And you probably got about a foot, foot two construction. So your finished ceiling there probably, let's call it nine feet, nine foot one. And then the bulkhead above that is nine feet with the foot of construction, which would leave us roughly, that's the stair bulkhead portion, would leave us roughly around um, eight foot clear in that stair bulkhead. 
So the, the overall height of that enlargement would be 194 between the stair bulkhead and the proposed livable space, if you will. And now should I go to the roof plan, Sarah? Um, well, I can see in this section okay. what the setback is, but thank you. Okay, commissioners, do we have any final questions? All right, I am starting to uh, request to unmute all of you so that we can close the hearing and move to our discussion. So um, please look for that. And um, Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Holford Smith, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so the hearing is now closed and we'll move to our discussion. Um, three components to the application. One is the restoration of the missing stoop in a straight form instead of a box shape. Two is a rooftop addition, and three is a rear yard addition, which is projecting no deeper than the existing and just filling in and meeting the next L. Um, the, the rooftop addition is not visible from a public thoroughfare, and um, I believe meets would technically meet the rules, except that the staff cannot approve a rooftop addition and a rear yard addition at the same time. So we'd be looking at the cumulative effect of those. And I do want to just say on the stoop, um, the commission has long taken the position that a stoop is better than no stoop and um, has often embraced opportunities <clears throat> to restore a stoop to a building, even if it's not in the same configuration where there are restrictions that would <clears throat> preclude that. And in that would be particularly true in cases where there's a row where other stoops have been removed and there's no identifiable pattern remaining, but even where there is a pattern, the commission has taken that position. So just to set that up, um, I think we'll go ahead and start our discussion. Commissioner Bland, would you like to start on this one? Um, I will. Um, um, I think stoop better than no stoop and there's no stoop now and uh, the box stoop that we might have wished for and the owner wished for uh, apparently can't be built at least uh, not without a lot of extra shenanigans and working through with city agencies and so forth so I and I don't accept the idea that we should cut a tree a tree down in order to uh, to have a box stoop as opposed to the straight stoop so I, I, I and there are other straight stoops uh, on this block, I, I accept the stoop as, as it is. Um, the rear yard addition, uh, I think I'm persuaded that it doesn't go out further than the existing L and it's just infilling that little piece. It is infilling it for three levels. I think I can accept that. And the rooftop addition, I would, I can also accept, but I also think that often we just say lower it and uh, architects can be smart and figure out how to lower it um, a foot or two uh, and reduce the whole thing. Even though it can't be seen, it, it is um, uh, not adjacent to other uh, rooftop additions. And so therefore it is, um, I think, incumbent upon us to have it as low as possible. Commissioner Lutfi. Um, I agree with Fred. The 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 straight stoop is better than no stoop. Um, I don't have a problem with the rooftop addition either. I actually, um, in thinking about this full uh, three-story addition was thinking, you know, there are um, other three-story additions here, but they are just part of the L. And I wouldn't mind if it goes across, but then I would bring it down to two stories. Commissioner Jefferson. Um, straight stoop is fine with me. The three story closing in of the L is fine with me. I'm a little concerned about from the section, I don't quite understand that. Are they adding? They're adding a piece onto the roof. 
correct and it doesn't align with the face. I'm, I'm confused with the section, but I think the, the, I would rather see only three stories and see that face, that three foot six face pushed back. So it, it feels smaller. I think it's too big. The, to set back the rear facade of the rooftop addition yes, further correct. than three feet. Okay. Commissioner Gustafson. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty much okay with the rooftop addition as it is. It's non-visible and it's set back. Um, I, I, I'm, I, ha I guess I, I am told by other agencies I have no choice but to accept the straight stoop, which is particularly annoying because if you look up and down this block, there are at least a dozen stoops that are box stoops, um, pre-existing obviously, um, that create exactly the same distance between the stoop and the trees up and down this block. So, you know, other than creating a, a sort of a, a, a zigzagging path there, um, it, it's almost absurd that they wouldn't allow it. Um, the um, rear yard addition, if in fact it uh, aligns with the projection of the adjacent um, uh, rear L's, uh, then I'm okay with it. Okay, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Uh, thanks. I'm in agreement with the others about the stoop. Um, I do think that the, the roof addition is not visible. I can approve it as presented, but I am opposed to the full width uh, on the rear. I think there's just too much, um, too many instances and examples here of L um, and the two situations on this side of the street where there has been are at the very ends, uh, and so I think that in this case, this should not be expanded, not even for one. Senator Helford Smith. Uh, I'm in agreement with the stoop. I think um, the straight stoop is preferable to no stoop. Um, the rear, I think it is, I think overall is sort of adding too much bulk to this building. And I think if they, um, want to have this full width addition in the back then it should be limited to two floors uh, and I agree that the the height of the rooftop addition should be reduced as much as possible. Okay Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I agree that uh, the uh, box uh, stoop is uh, it's okay to uh, go ahead with the <clears throat> stoop uh, that they're permitted to do. Um, I was also uh, kind of struggling with this uh, issue about the um, full width addition because when we, as we used to prove these in the past, it was a way of uh, sort of, you know, cleaning up a row in some ways. And it, it seemed fine to me, but not to, not when it was gonna end up being uh, three stories or full, full height or something. Uh, so I'm supportive of, of the other commissioners who think that it should only go to the second floor if it's going to be a full width addition. Um, and as far as the um, rooftop addition, obviously, if it can be somewhat reduced with the working of the staff, I think that's fine, but I, I can't approve it. Uh, but it, we, it would be fine to try to bring it down a little bit if that's possible. Commissioner Goldblum. Um, I, uh, I agree with everyone on the stoop. Uh, stoop was better than no stoop. I think that the use of 44 West 95th as an example is misplaced because of its adjacency at the end of the road to a larger building. Therefore, I think that the infill at the back should, I, I'm okay with it going full height, but I think as we have done in the past, um, if it is going to go full height, it, the, the face of it should be set back a little bit so that the row of L's is still, is still discernible um, and the fenestration and other, other things be, be arranged to uh, allow for the reading of the L and the infill. Um, the other way to do it is, is as people have said, the uh, keeping it to a two-story addition, which I think would be fine. Um, and in terms of the roof L, rooftop addition, I think that uh, because 44 was at the end, it's different than um, 
being in the middle of a road that is more or less uh, untrammeled. So I would say that the rooftop addition should set back to match 34 at the, uh, at the least. And Commissioner Devonshire. Um, the rear addition, if it is going to be uh, full width, needs to be two stories only. I would like to see the rooftop addition be reduced in height. And I'm okay with the uh, new configuration of the front stoop. Um, but I remain, like John, stupefied at the rule that uh, is requiring this change. Thank you. Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I agree with the uh, commissioner's uh, the comments. I think uh, it's quite obviously the front stoop is better than no stoop. Uh, I think the concern seems to be the rear and depending what the majority wants to do and also if the height could be slightly reduced on the top, uh, that should be done too. Okay, all right. So I think what we have is, um, well, we have a, a couple of commissioners who are, well, I think everybody, whether reluctantly or not, is supportive of the straight stoop. And I think um, in terms of the rooftop and rear yard addition, um, there's, I think, a consensus here that it is in one way or another needs to be reduced. And I think that um, there are some commissioners who are comfortable with the rear yard addition. I myself am in this case because I do think that this block has a variety and I do think that we have approved um, full width three-story additions where the L has no significant features and it's abutting another L and not blocking a, another neighbor's window or blocking in another neighbor's window. But I think um, we don't have enough votes for that as is. And so um, if those who would support it as is would also support a two-story addition, we could make a motion for that modification. Um, and then finally, a modification to look at lowering the height or and push or pushing and or pushing back the setback of the yard addition. So I think what I can do is um, go ahead and and make that motion to approve with modifications, and I'll do it since it will need a little bit of tailoring here. So um, let me do that. In the matter of um, certificate of appropriateness, docket number 21 01103, 26 West 95th Street in the Upper West Side, Central Park West Historic District, an altered style, Renaissance, an altered Renaissance Revival style row house designed by Neville and Bagg and built in, 19, in 1892 to 93. This is an application to construct rooftop and rear yard additions and a stoop. And I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the proposed work will not damage or destroy any significant architectural features of the building or site. That the box stoop matching the historic stoop in footprint could not be constructed without removing a mature tree or significantly narrowing a portion of the sidewalk. That the placement proportions and finishes and details of the stoop and areaway wall will be compatible with the design of the house and in keeping with such aspects of other stoops and areaway walls found throughout the streetscape. That the presence of the modified stoop will facilitate the restoration of facade details removed prior to the designation of the historic district and will return the building and the row closer to their, to their original appearance. That the proposed um, rooftop and rear yard additions and metal railing will not be visible from public thoroughfares. That the proposed rooftop addition um, will be set back from the front and rear facade and um, the rear addition will not rise to the full height of the building and therefore will not overwhelm the building. That other rear yard additions of um, similar depth exist within the block and that um, the rear yard addition featuring brick cladding and punched openings at the second floor will harmonize with the materials palette and proportions of the secondary facades surrounding the buildings. Um, however, I find that the, um, oh, the cumulative effect of the rooftop and rear yard addition will overwhelm this building in row and therefore I recommend that the 
um, rooftop addition be looked at in consultation with the staff to lower and possibly set back the rear facade and that the rear yard addition be at full width be reduced to two stories. Okay, Commissioner Holford Smith, would you second that motion? Mute. I second the motion. Okay, Rich, let's take a vote. Okay. Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and one opposed, the motion carries. That's approved with those modifications. Thank you. For the staff. And we're going to break for lunch now. We are a little behind schedule. We um, are, so the, there is one more item that was scheduled to go before lunch, which is 250 Convent Avenue, part of City College. So we will um, break for 30 minutes and come back at 1.40 and we will resume our schedule beginning with item number seven, which is 250 Convent Avenue. So we'll ask all members of the public to leave the meeting at this time and rejoin at 1.40. And um, if you don't leave, if we remove you, you'll have difficulty rejoining. So we ask you to just voluntarily remove yourself and rejoin. Um, commissioners, we just need to turn our video and sound off and I will see you all in 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.